Chapter 12 It was on the 9th of November, the eve of his own 38th birthday, as he often remembered afterwards. He was walking home about 11 o'clock from Lord Henry's, where he'd been dining, and was wrapped in heavy furs as the night was cold and foggy. At the corner of Grosvenor Square and South Audley Street, a man passed him in the mist, walking very fast and with the collar of his grey ulster turned up. He had a bag in his hand. Dorian recognised him. It was Basil Hallward. A strange sense of fear, for which he could not account, came over him. He made no sign of recognition and went on quickly in the direction of his own house. But Hallward had seen him. Dorian heard him first stopping on the pavement and then hurrying after him. In a few moments his hand was on his arm. Dorian, what an extraordinary piece of luck. I've been waiting for you in your library ever since nine o'clock. Finally I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed as he let me out. I am off to Paris by the midnight train and I particularly wanted to see you before I left. I thought it was you, or rather your fur coat as you passed me, but I wasn't quite sure. Didn't you recognise me? In this fog, my dear Basil, why I can't even recognise Grosvenor Square. I believe my house is somewhere about here, but I don't feel at all certain about it. I'm sorry you're going away, as I have not seen you for ages, but I suppose you will be back soon. No, I'm going to be out of England for six months. I intend to take a studio in Paris and shut myself up till I've finished a great picture I have in my head. However, it wasn't about myself I wanted to talk. Here we are at your door. Let me come in for a moment. I have something to say to you. I shall be charmed, but won't you miss your train? said Dorian Gray languidly as he passed up the steps and opened the door with his latch key. The lamplight struggled out through the fog, and Hallward looked at his watch. I have heaps of time, he answered. The train doesn't go till 12.15, and it is only just 11. In fact, I was on my way to the club to look for you when I met you. You see, I shan't have any delay about luggage, as I have sent on my heavy things. All I have with me is in this bag, and I can easily get to Victoria in twenty minutes. Dorian looked at him and smiled. What a way for a fashionable painter to travel. A Gladstone bag and an Ulster. Come in, or the fog will get into the house. And mind you don't talk about anything serious. Nothing is serious nowadays, at least nothing should be. Hallward shook his head as he entered and followed Dorian into the library. There was a bright wood fire blazing in the large open hearth. The lamps were lit, and an open Dutch silver spirit case stood with some siphons of soda water and large cut glass tumblers on a little marketary table. You see, your servant made me quite at home, Dorian. He gave me everything I wanted, including your best gold-tipped cigarettes. He is a most hospitable creature. I like him much better than the Frenchman you used to have. What has become of the Frenchman, by the by? Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I believe he married Lady Radley's maid and has established her in Paris as an English dressmaker. Aglomanie is very fashionable over there now, I hear. It seems silly of the French, doesn't it? But, do you know, he was not at all a bad servant. I never liked him, but I had nothing to complain about. One often imagines things that are quite absurd. He was really very devoted to me, and seemed quite sorry when he went away. Have another brandy and soda? Or would you like a hock and seltzer? I always take hock and seltzer myself. There are sure to be some in the next room. Thanks, I won't have anything more, said the painter, taking his cap and coat off and throwing them on the bag that he had placed in the corner. And now, my dear fellow, I want to speak to you seriously. Don't frown like that. You make it so much more difficult for me. What is it all about? cried Dorian in his petulant way, flinging himself down on the sofa. I hope it is not about myself. I am tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself answered Hallward in his grave, deep voice. And I must say it to you. I shall only keep you half an hour. Dorian sighed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. It is not much to ask of you, Dorian, and it is entirely for your own sake that I am speaking. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said against you in London. I don't wish to know anything about them. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself don't interest me. They have not got the charm of novelty. They must interest you, Dorian. Every gentleman is interested in his good name. 
You don't want people to talk of you as something vile and degraded. Of course you have your position and your wealth and all that kind of thing, but position and wealth are not everything. Mind you, I don't believe these rumours at all. At least, I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. People talk sometimes of secret vices that are no such things. If a wretched man has a vice, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the droop of his eyelids, the moulding of his hands even. Somebody, I won't mention his name, but you know him, came to me last year to have his portrait done. I had never seen him before, and had never heard anything about him at the time, though I have heard a good deal since. He offered an extravagant price. I refused him. There was something in the shape of his fingers that I hated. I know now that I was quite right in what I fancied about him. His life is dreadful, but you, Dorian, with your pure, bright, innocent face and your marvellous, untroubled youth, I can't believe anything against you. And yet I see you very seldom, and you never come down to the studio now, and when I am away from you, and I hear all these hideous things that people are whispering about you, I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian, that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves the room of a club when you enter it? Why is it that so many gentlemen in London will neither go to your house nor invite you to theirs? You used to be a friend of Lord Staveley. I met him at dinner last week. Your name happened to come up in conversation in connection with the miniatures you have lent to the exhibition at the Dudley. Staveley curled his lip and said that you might have the most artistic tastes, but that you were a man whom no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know and whom no chaste woman should sit in the same room with. I reminded him that I was a friend of yours and asked him what he meant. He told me. He told me right out before everybody. It was horrible. Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? There was that wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his great friend. There was Sir Henry Ashton who had to leave England with a tarnished name. You and he were inseparable. What about Adrian Singleton and his dreadful end? What about Lord Kent's only son and his career? I met his father yesterday in St. James's Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. What about the young Duke of Perth? What sort of life has he got now? What gentleman would associate with him? Stop, Basil. You are talking about things of which you know nothing, said Dorian Gray, biting his lip and with a note of infinite contempt in his voice. You ask me why Berwick leaves a room when I enter it? It is because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. With such blood as he has in his veins, how could his record be clean? You ask me about Henry Ashton and young Perth. Did I teach the one his vices and the other his debauchery? If Kent's silly son takes his wife from the streets, what is that to me? If Adrian Singleton writes his friend's name across a bill, am I his keeper? I know how people chatter in England. The middle classes air their moral prejudices over their gross dinner tables and whisper about what they call the profligacies of their betters in order to try and pretend that they are in smart society and on intimate terms with the people they slander. In this country, it is enough for a man to have distinction and brains for every common tongue to wag against him. And what sort of lives do these people who pose as being moral lead themselves? My dear fellow, you forget that we are in the native land of the hypocrite. Dorian, cried Hallward, that is not the question. England is bad enough, I know, and English society is all wrong. That is the reason why I want you to be fine. You have not been fine. One has a right to judge a man by the effect he has over his friends. Yours seem to lose all sense of honour, of goodness, of purity. You have filled them with a madness for pleasure. They have gone down into the depths. You led them there. Yes, you led them there, and yet you can smile as you are smiling now. And there is worse behind. I know you and Harry are inseparable. Surely for that reason, if for none other, you should not have made his sister's name a byword. Take care, Basil. You go too far. I must speak, and you must listen. You shall listen. When you met Lady Gwendolen, not a breath of scandal had ever touched her. Is there a single decent woman in London now who would drive with her in the park? Why, even her children are not allowed to live with her. Then there are other stories. Stories that you have been seen creeping at dawn out of dreadful houses and slinking in disguise into the foulest dens in London. Are they true? Can they be true? When I first heard them, I laughed. I hear them now and they make me shudder. 
What about your country house and the life that is led there? Dorian, you don't know what is said about you. I won't tell you that I don't want to preach to you. I remember Harry saying once that every man who turned himself into an amateur curate for the moment always began by saying that, and then proceeded to break his word, I do want to preach to you. I want you to lead such a life as will make the world respect you. I want you to have a clean name for a fair record. I want you to get rid of the dreadful people you associate with. Don't shrug your shoulders like that. Don't be so indifferent. You have a wonderful influence. Let it be for good, not for evil. They say that you corrupt everyone with whom you become intimate, and that it is quite sufficient for you to enter a house for shame of some kind to follow after. I don't know whether it is so or not. How should I know? But it is said of you. I am told things that it seems impossible to doubt. Lord Gloucester was one of my greatest friends at Oxford. He showed me a letter that his wife had written to him when she was dying alone in her villa at Mentone. Your name was implicated in the most terrible confession I ever read. I told him that it was absurd, that I knew you thoroughly, and that you were incapable of anything of the kind. Know you? I wonder, do I know you? Before I could answer that, I should have to see your soul. To see my soul, muttered Dorian Gray, starting up from the sofa and turning almost white from fear. Yes, answered Hallward, gravely, and with a deep-toned sorrow in his voice, to see your soul, but only God can do that. A bitter laugh of mockery broke from the lips of the younger man. You shall see it yourself tonight, he cried, seizing a lamp from the table. Come, it is your own handiwork. Why shouldn't you look at it? You can tell the world all about it afterwards if you choose. Nobody would believe you. If they did believe you, they would like me all the better for it. I know the age better than you do, though you will prate about it so tediously. Come, I tell you, you have chatted enough about corruption. Now you shall look on it face to face. There was the madness of pride in every word he uttered. He stamped his foot upon the ground in his boyish, insolent manner. He felt a terrible joy at the thought that someone else was to share his secret, and that the man who had painted the portrait that was the origin of all his shame was to be burdened for the rest of his life with the hideous memory of what he had done. Yes, he continued, coming closer to him and looking steadfastly into his stern eyes, I shall show you my soul. You shall see the thing that you fancy only God can see. Hallward started back. This is blasphemy, Dorian, he cried. You must not say things like that. They are horrible and they don't mean anything. You think so? He laughed again. I know so. As for what I said to you tonight, I said it for your good. You know I have always been a staunch friend to you. A twisted flash of pain shot across the painter's face. He paused for a moment, and a wild feeling of pity came over him. After all, what right had he to pry into the life of Dorian Gray? If he had done a tithe of what was rumoured about him, how much he must have suffered. Then he straightened himself up and walked over to the fireplace and stood there, looking at the burning logs with their frost-like ashes and their throbbing cores of flame. I am waiting, Basil, said the young man in a hard, clear voice. He turned round. What I have to say is this, he cried. You must give me some answer to these horrible charges that are made against you. If you tell me that they are absolutely untrue from beginning to end, I shall believe you. Deny them, Dorian, deny them. Can't you see what I am going through? My God, don't tell me that you are bad and corrupt and shameful. Dorian Gray smiled. There was a curl of contempt in his lips. Come upstairs, Basil, he said quietly. I keep a diary of my life from day to day, and it never leaves the room in which it is written. I shall show it to you if you come with me. I shall come with you, Dorian, if you wish it. I see I have missed my train. That makes no matter. I can go tomorrow. But don't ask me to read anything tonight. All I want is a plain answer to my question. That shall be given to you upstairs. I could not give it here. You will not have to read long. From plastic throat. Yes, it was Dorian himself. But who had done it? He seemed to recognise his own brushwork, and the frame was his own design. The idea was monstrous, yet he felt afraid. He seized the lighted candle and held it to the picture. 
in the left-hand corner was his own name, traced in long letters of bright vermilion. It was some foul parody, some infamous, ignoble satire. He had never done that. Still, it was his own picture. He knew it, and he felt as if his blood had changed in a moment from fire to sluggish ice. His own picture, what did it mean? Why had it altered? He turned and looked at Dorian Gray with the eyes of a sick man. His mouth twitched, and his parched tongue seemed unable to articulate. He passed his hand across his forehead. It was dank with clammy sweat. The young man was leaning against the mantel shelf, watching him with that strange expression that one sees on the faces of those who are absorbed in a play when some great artist is acting. There was neither real sorrow in it nor real joy. There was simply the passion of the spectator, with perhaps a flicker of triumph in his eyes. He had taken the flower out of his coat and was smelling it, or pretending to do so. "'What does this mean?' cried Hallward at last. His own voice sounded shrill and curious in his ears. "'Years ago, when I was a boy,' said Dorian Gray, crushing the flower in his hand, "'you met me, flattered me, and taught me to be vain of my good looks. "'One day you introduced me to a friend of yours who explained to me the wonder of youth.' and you finished a portrait of me that revealed to me the wonder of beauty. In a mad moment that, even now, I don't know whether I regret or not, I made a wish. Perhaps you would call it a prayer. I remember it. Oh, how well I remember it. No, the thing is impossible. The room is damp. Mildew has got into the canvas. The paints I used had some wretched mineral poison in them. I tell you, the thing is impossible. Ah, what is impossible? murmured the young man, going over to the window and leaning his forehead against the cold, mist-stained glass. You told me you had destroyed it. I was wrong. It has destroyed me. I don't believe it is my picture. Can't you see your ideal in it? said Dorian bitterly. My ideal, as you call it, as you called it. There was nothing evil in it, nothing shameful. You were to me such an ideal as I shall never meet again. This is the face of a satyr. It is the face of my soul. Christ, what a thing I must have worshipped. It has the eyes of a devil. Each of us has heaven and hell in him, Basil, cried Dorian with a wild gesture of despair. Hallward turned again to the portrait and gazed at it. My God, if it is true, he exclaimed. And this is what you have done with your life. Why, you must be worse even than those who talk against you fancy you to be. He held the light up again to the canvas and examined it. The surface seemed to be quite undisturbed, and as he had left it. It was from within, apparently, that the foulness and horror had come. Through some strange quickening of inner life, the leprosies of sin were slowly eating the thing away. The rotting of a corpse in a watery grave was not so fearful. His hand shook, and the candle fell from its socket on the floor and lay there spluttering. He placed his foot on it and put it out. Then he flung himself into the rickety chair that was standing by the table and buried his face in his hands. Good God, Dorian, what a lesson. What an awful lesson. There was no answer, but he could hear the young man sobbing at the window. Pray, Dorian, pray, he murmured. What is it that one was taught to say in one's boyhood? Lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our sins, wash away our iniquities. Let us say that together. The prayer of your pride has been answered. The prayer of your repentance will be answered also. I worshipped you too much. I am punished for it. You worshipped yourself too much. We are both punished. Dorian Gray turned slowly around and looked at him with tear-dimmed eyes. It is too late, Basil, he faltered. It is never too late, Dorian. Let us kneel down and try if we cannot remember a prayer. Isn't there a verse somewhere? Though your sins be as scarlet, yet I will make them as white as snow. Those words mean nothing to me now. Hush, don't say that. You have done enough evil in your life, my God. Don't you see that accursed thing leering at us? 
Dorian Gray glanced at the picture, and suddenly an uncontrollable feeling of hatred for Basil Hallward came over him, as though it had been suggested to him by the image on the canvas, whispered into his ear by those grinning lips. The mad passions of a hunted animal stirred within him, and he loathed the man who was seated at the table more than in his whole life he had ever loathed anything. He glanced wildly around. Something glimmered on the top of the painted chest that faced him. His eye fell on it. He knew what it was. It was a knife that he had brought up some days before to cut a piece of cord and had forgotten to take away with him. He moved slowly towards it, passing Hallward as he did so. As soon as he got behind him, he seized it and turned round. Hallward stirred in his chair as if he was going to rise. He rushed at him and dug the knife into the great vein that is behind the ear, crushing the man's head down on the table and stabbing again and again. There was a stifled groan and the horrible sound of someone choking with blood. Three times the outstretched arms shot up convulsively, waving grotesque, stiff-fingered hands in the air. He stabbed him twice more, but the man did not move. Something began to trickle on the floor. He waited for a moment, still pressing the head down. Then he threw the knife on the table and listened. He could hear nothing but the drip, drip on the threadbare carpet. He opened the door and went out on the landing. The house was absolutely quiet. No one was about. For a few seconds he stood bending over the balustrade and peering down into the black, seething well of darkness. Then he took out the key and returned to the room, locking himself in as he did so. The thing was still seated in the chair, straining over the table with bowed head and humped back and long, fantastic arms. Had it not been for the red, jagged tear in the neck and the clotted black pool that was slowly widening on the table, one would have said that the man was simply asleep. How quickly it had all been done! He felt strangely calm, and walking over to the window opened it and stepped out on the balcony. The wind had blown the fog away, and the sky was like a monstrous peacock's tail, starred with myriads of golden eyes. He looked down and saw the policeman going his rounds and flashing the long beam of his lantern on the doors of the silent houses. The crimson spot of a prowling hansom gleamed at the corner and then vanished. A woman in a fluttering shawl was creeping slowly by the railings, staggering as she went. Now and then she stopped and peered back. Once she began to sing in a hoarse voice. The policeman strolled over and said something to her. She stumbled away, laughing. A bitter blast swept across the square. The gas lamps flickered and became blue, and the leafless trees shook their black iron branches to and fro. He shivered and went back, closing the window behind him. Having reached the door, he turned the key and opened it. He did not even glance at the murdered man. He felt that the secret of the whole thing was not to realise the situation. The friend who had painted the fatal portrait to which all his misery had been due had gone out of his life. That was enough. Then he remembered the lamp. It was a rather curious one of Moorish workmanship, made of dull silver inlaid with arabesques of burnished steel and studded with coarse turquoises. Perhaps it might be missed by his servant and questions would be asked. He hesitated for a moment, then he turned back and took it from the table. He could not help seeing the dead thing. How still it was. How horribly white the long hands looked. It was like a dreadful wax image. Having locked the door behind him, he crept quietly downstairs. The woodwork creaked and seemed to cry out as if in pain. He stopped several times and waited. No, everything was still. It was merely the sound of his own footsteps. When he reached the library, he saw the bag and coat in the corner. They must be hidden away somewhere. He unlocked a secret press that was in the wainscoting, a press in which he kept his own curious disguises, and put them into it. He could easily burn them afterwards. Then he pulled out his watch. 
it was twenty minutes to two. He sat down and began to think. Every year, every month almost, men were strangled in England for what he had done. There had been a madness of murder in the air. Some red star had come too close to the earth, and yet what evidence was there against him? Basil Hallward had left the house at eleven. No one had seen him come in again. Most of the servants were at Selby Royal. His valet had gone to bed. Paris. Yes, it was to Paris that Basil had gone, and by the midnight train as he had intended. With his curious reserved habits, it would be months before any suspicions would be aroused. Months. Everything could be destroyed long before then. A sudden thought struck him. He put on his fur coat and hat and went out into the hall. There he paused, hearing the slow, heavy tread of the policeman on the pavement outside and seeing the flash of the bullseye reflected in the window. He waited and held his breath. After a few moments he drew back the latch and slipped out, shutting the door very gently behind him. Then he began ringing the bell. In about five minutes his valet appeared, half-dressed and looking very drowsy. I am sorry to have had to wake you up, Francis, he said, stepping in, but I had forgotten my latch key. What time is it? Ten minutes past two, sir, answered the man, looking at the clock and blinking. Ten minutes past two? How horribly late. You must wake me at nine tomorrow. I have some work to do. All right, sir. Did anyone call this evening? Mr. Hallwood, sir. He stayed here till eleven, and then he went away to catch his train. Oh, I am sorry I didn't see him. Did he leave any message? No, sir. Except that he would write to you from Paris if he did not find you at the club. That will do, Francis. Don't forget to call me at nine tomorrow. No, sir. The man shambled down the passage in his slippers. Dorian Gray threw his hat and coat upon the table and passed into the library. For a quarter of an hour he walked up and down the room, biting his lip and thinking. Then he took down the blue book from one of the shelves and began to turn over the leaves. Alan Campbell. 152 Hartford Street, Mayfair. Yes, that was the man he wanted. Chapter 14 At nine o'clock the next morning, his servant came in with a cup of chocolate on a tray and opened the shutters. Dorian was sleeping quite peacefully, lying on his right side with one hand underneath his cheek. He looked like a boy who had been tired out with play or study. The man had to touch him twice on the shoulder before he woke, and as he opened his eyes a faint smile passed across his lips, as though he had been lost in some delightful dream. Yet he had not dreamed at all. His night had been untroubled by any images of pleasure or of pain, but youth smiles without any reason. It is one of its chiefest charms. He turned round and, leaning upon his elbow, began to sip his chocolate. The mellow November sun came streaming into the room. The sky was bright, and there was a genial warmth in the air. It was almost like a morning in May. Gradually the events of the preceding night crept with silent blood-stained feet into his brain and reconstructed themselves there with terrible distinctness. He winced at the memory of all that he had suffered, and for a moment the same curious feeling of loathing for Basil Hallward that had made him kill him as he sat in the chair came back to him, and he grew cold with passion. The dead man was still sitting there too, and in the sunlight now. How horrible that was. Such hideous things were for the darkness, not for the day. He felt that if he brooded on what he had gone through, he would sicken or grow mad. There were sins whose fascination was more in the memory than in the doing of them. Strange triumphs that gratified the pride more than the passions, and gave to the intellect a quickened sense of joy, greater than any joy they brought, or could ever bring, to the senses. But this was not one of them. It was a thing to be driven out of the mind, to be drugged with poppies, to be strangled lest it might strangle one itself. When the half-hour struck, he passed his hand across his forehead, and then got up hastily, and dressed himself with even more than his usual care, giving a good deal of attention to the choice of his necktie and scarf pin, and changing his rings more than once. 
He spent a long time also over breakfast, tasting the various dishes, talking to his valet about some new liveries that he was thinking of getting made for the servants at Selby, and going through his correspondence. At some of the letters he smiled. Three of them bored him. One he read several times over and then tore up with a slight look of annoyance in his face. That awful thing a woman's memory, as Lord Henry had once said. After he had drunk his cup of black coffee, he wiped his lips slowly with a napkin, motioned to his servant to wait, and going over to the table sat down and wrote two letters. One he put in his pocket, the other he handed to the valet. Take this round to 152 Hartford Street, Francis, and if Mr Campbell is out of town, get his address. As soon as he was alone, he lit a cigarette and began sketching upon a piece of paper, drawing first flowers and bits of architecture, and then human faces. Suddenly he remarked that every face that he drew seemed to have a fantastic likeness to Basil Hallward. He frowned, and getting up, went over to the bookcase and took out a volume at hazard. He was determined that he would not think about what had happened until it became absolutely necessary that he should do so. When he had stretched himself on the sofa, he looked at the title page of the book. It was Gautier's Emo et Camus. Charpentier's Japanese paper edition, the Jacquemart etching. The binding was of citron green leather with a design of gilt trellis work and dotted pomegranates. It had been given to him by Adrian Singleton. As he turned over the pages, his eye fell on the poem about the hand of Lassanaire, the cold yellow hand du supplice encore mal lavé, with its downy red hairs and its doigts de faune. He glanced at his own white taper fingers, shuddering slightly in spite of himself, and passed on till he came to those lovely stanzas upon Venice. Sur une gamme chromatique, la scène de peur ruisselant, la Venus de l'Adriatique, sont de l'eau, son corps rose et blanc. Les dômes sur l'azur des Andes, suivant la phrase au pur contour, s'enflant comme des gorges rondes que soulève un soupir d'amour. Le squiff aborde et me dépose, jetant son amarre au pilier, devant une façade rose, sur le marbre d'un escalier. How exquisite they were! As one read them, one seemed to be floating down the green waterways of the pink and pearl city, seated in a black gondola with silver prow and trailing curtains. The mere lines looked to him like those straight lines of turquoise blue that follow one as one pushes out to the Lido. The sudden flashes of colour reminded him of the gleam of the opal and iris-throated birds that flutter round the tall, honeycombed campanile, or stalk with such stately grace through the dim, dust-stained arcades. Leaning back with half-closed eyes, he kept saying over and over to himself, Devant une façade rose, sur le marbre d'un escalier. The whole of Venice was in those two lines. He remembered the autumn that he had passed there, and a wonderful love that had stirred him to mad, delightful follies. There was romance in every place, but Venice, like Oxford, had kept the background for romance, and to the true romantic, background was everything, or almost everything. Basil had been with him part of the time, and had gone wild over Tintoret. Poor Basil. What a horrible way for a man to die. He sighed, and took up the volume again and tried to forget. He read of the swallows that fly in and out of the little cafe at Smyrna, where the hajis sit counting their amber beads, and the turbaned merchants smoke their long, tasseled pipes and talk gravely to each other. He read of the obelisk in the Place de la Concorde that weeps tears of granite in its lonely, sunless exile and longs to be back by the hot lotus-covered Nile where there are sphinxes and rose-red ibises and white vultures with gilded claws and crocodiles with small beryl eyes that crawl over the green steaming mud. He began to brood over those verses which, drawing music from kiss-stained marble, tell of that curious statue that Gautier compares to a contralto voice, the monstre charmant, that couches in the porphyry room of the Louvre. But after a time the book fell from his hand. He grew nervous and then. Every moment was of vital importance. They had been great friends once, five years before, almost inseparable indeed. Then the intimacy had come suddenly to an end. 
When they met in society now, it was only Dorian Gray who smiled. Alan Campbell never did. He was an extremely clever young man, though he had no real appreciation of the visible arts. And whatever little sense of the beauty of poetry he possessed, he had gained entirely from Dorian. His dominant intellectual passion was for science. At Cambridge, he had spent a great deal of his time working in the laboratory and had taken a good class in the natural science tripos of his year. Indeed, he was still devoted to the study of chemistry and had a laboratory of his own, in which he used to shut himself up all day long, greatly to the annoyance of his mother, who had set her heart on his standing for Parliament and had a vague idea that a chemist was a person who made up prescriptions. He was an excellent musician, however, as well, and played both the violin and the piano better than most amateurs. In fact, it was music that had first brought him and Dorian Gray together. Music and that indefinable attraction that Dorian seemed to be able to exercise whenever he wished, and indeed exercised often without being conscious of it. They had met at Lady Berkshire's the night that Rubinstein played there, and after that used to be always seen together at the opera, and wherever good music was going on. For 18 months their intimacy lasted. Campbell was always either at Selby Royal or in Grosvenor Square. To him, as to many others, Dorian Gray was the type of everything that is wonderful and fascinating in life. Whether or not a quarrel had taken place between them, no one ever knew. But suddenly people remarked that they scarcely spoke when they met, and that Campbell seemed always to go away early from any party at which Dorian Gray was present. He had changed, too, was strangely melancholy at times, appeared almost to dislike hearing music, and would never himself play giving as his excuse when he was called upon that he was so absorbed in science that he had no time left in which to practice. And this was certainly true. Every day he seemed to become more interested in biology, and his name appeared once or twice in some of the scientific reviews in connection with certain curious experiments. This was the man Dorian Gray was waiting for. Every second he kept glancing at the clock. As the minutes went by, he became horribly agitated. At last he got up, and began to pace up and down the room, looking like a beautiful caged thing. He took long, stealthy strides. His hands were curiously cold. The suspense became unbearable. Time seemed to him to be crawling with feet of lead, while he, by monstrous winds, was being swept towards the jagged edge of some black cleft of precipice. He knew what was waiting for him there, saw it, indeed, and shuddering, crushed with dank hands, his burning lids as though he would have robbed the brain of sight and driven the eyeballs back into their cave. It was useless. The brain had its own food on which it battened, and the imagination made grotesque by terror, twisted and distorted as a living thing by pain, danced like some foul puppet on a stand and grinned through moving masks. Then suddenly, time stopped for him. Yes, that blind, slow-breathing thing crawled no more, and horrible thoughts, time being dead, raced nimbly on in front and dragged a hideous future from its grave and showed it to him. He stared at it. Its very horror made him stone. At last the door opened and his servant entered. He turned, glazed eyes upon him. Mr. Campbell, sir, said the man. A sigh of relief broke from his parched lips and the colour came back to his cheeks. Ask him to come in at once, Francis. He felt that he was himself again. His mood of cowardice had passed away. The man bowed and retired. In a few moments, Alan Campbell walked in, looking very stern and rather pale, his pallor being intensified by his coal black hair and dark eyebrows. Alan, this is kind of you. I thank you for coming. I had intended never to enter your house again, Gray, but you said it was a matter of life and death. His voice was hard and cold. He spoke with slow deliberation. There was a look of contempt in the steady, searching gaze that he turned on Dorian. He kept his hands in the pockets of his astrakhan coat and seemed not to have noticed the gesture with which he had been greeted. Yes, it is a matter of life and death, Alan, and to more than one person. Sit down. Campbell took a chair by the table and Dorian sat opposite to him. The two men's eyes met. In Dorian's there was infinite pity. He knew that what he was going to do was dreadful. After a strained moment of silence, he leaned across and said very quietly, but watching the effects of each word upon the face of him he had sent for, Alan, in a locked room at the top of this house, a room to which nobody but myself has access, 
A dead man is seated at a table. He has been dead ten hours now. Don't stir, and don't look at me like that. Who the man is, why he died, how he died, are matters that do not concern you. What you have to do is this. Stop, Gray. I don't want to know anything further. Whether what you have told me is true or not true doesn't concern me. I entirely decline to be mixed up in your life. Keep your horrible secrets to yourself. They don't interest me any more. Alan, they will have to interest you. This one will have to interest you. I am awfully sorry for you, Alan, but I can't help myself. You are the one man who is able to save me. I am forced to bring you into the matter. I have no option. Alan, you are scientific. You know about chemistry and things of that kind. You have made experiments. What you have got to do is to destroy the thing that is upstairs, to destroy it so that not a vestige of it will be left. Nobody saw this person come into the house. Indeed, at the present moment, he is supposed to be in Paris. He will not be missed for months. When he is missed, there must be no trace of him found here. You, Alan, you must change him and everything that belongs to him into a handful of ashes that I may scatter in the air. You are mad, Dorian. Ah, I was waiting for you to call me Dorian. You are mad, I tell you. Mad to imagine that I would raise a finger to help you. Mad to make this monstrous confession. I will have nothing to do with this matter, whatever it is. Do you think I'm going to peril my reputation for you? What is it to me what devil's work you are up to? It was suicide, Alan. I am glad of that. But who drove him to it? You, I should fancy. Do you still refuse to do this for me? Of course I refuse. I will have absolutely nothing to do with it. I don't care what shame comes on you. You deserve it all. I should not be sorry to see you disgraced, publicly disgraced. How dare you ask me, of all men in the world, to mix myself up in this horror? I should have thought you knew more about people's characters. Your friend Lord Henry Wooten can't have taught you much about psychology, whatever else he has taught you. Nothing will induce me to stir a step to help you. You have come to the wrong man. Go to some of your friends. Don't come to me. Alan, it was murder. I killed him. You don't know what he had made me suffer. Whatever my life is, he had more to do with the making or the marring of it than poor Harry has had. He may not have intended it. The result was the same. Murder? Good God, Dorian, is that what you have come to? I shall not inform upon you. It is not my business. Besides, without my stirring in the matter, you are certain to be arrested. Nobody ever commits a crime without doing something stupid. But I will have nothing to do with it. You must have something to do with it. Wait, wait a moment, listen to me. Only listen, Alan. All I ask of you is to perform a certain scientific experiment. You go to hospitals and dead houses, and the horrors that you do there don't affect you. If in some hideous dissecting room or fetid laboratory you found this man lying on a leaden table with red gutters scooped out in it for the blood to flow through, you would simply look upon him as an admirable subject. You would not turn a hair. You would not believe that you were doing anything wrong. On the contrary, you would probably feel that you were benefiting the human race or increasing the sum of knowledge in the world or gratifying intellectual curiosity or something of that kind. What I want you to do is merely what you have often done before. Indeed, to destroy a body must be far less horrible than what you are accustomed to work at. And remember, it is the only piece of evidence against me. If it is discovered, I am lost, and it is sure to be discovered unless you help me. I have no desire to help you. You forget that. I am simply indifferent to the whole thing. It has nothing to do with me. Alan, I entreat you. Think of the position I am in. Just before you came, I almost fainted with terror. You may know terror yourself some day. No, don't think of that. Look at the matter purely from the scientific point of view. You don't inquire where the dead things on which you experiment come from. Don't inquire now. I have told you too much as it is. But I beg of you to do this. We were friends once, Alan. Don't speak about those days, Dorian. They are dead. The dead linger sometimes. The man upstairs will not go away. He is sitting at the table with bowed head and outstretched arms. Alan, Alan, if you don't come to my assistance, I am ruined. Why, they will hang me, Alan. Don't you understand? They will hang me for what I have done. There is no good in prolonging this scene. I absolutely refuse to do anything in the matter. It is insane of you to ask me. You refuse? Yes. I entreat you, Alan. It is useless.
The same look of pity came into Dorian Gray's eyes. Then he stretched out his hand, took a piece of paper, and wrote something on it. He read it over twice, folded it carefully, and pushed it across the table. Having done this, he got up and went over to the window. Campbell looked at him in surprise, and then took up the paper and opened it. As he read it, his face became ghastly pale, and he fell back in his chair. A horrible sense of sickness came over him. He felt as if his heart was beating itself to death in some empty hollow. After two or three minutes of terrible silence, Dorian turned round and came and stood behind him, putting his hand upon his shoulder. I am so sorry for you, Alan, he murmured, but you leave me no alternative. I have a letter written already. Here it is. You see the address? If you don't help me, I must send it. If you don't help me, I will send it. You know what the result will be. But you are going to help me. It is impossible for you to refuse now. I tried to spare you. You will do me the justice to admit that. You were stern, harsh, offensive. You treated me as no man has ever dared to treat me, no living man at any rate. I bore it all. Now it is for me to dictate terms. Campbell buried his face in his hands, and a shudder passed through him. Yes, it is my turn to dictate terms, Alan. You know what they are. The thing is quite simple. Come, don't work yourself into this fever. The thing has to be done. Face it and do it. A groan broke from Campbell's lips, and he shivered all over. The ticking of the clock on the mantelpiece seemed to him to be dividing time into separate atoms of agony, each of which was too terrible to be borne. He felt as if an iron ring was being slowly tightened round his forehead, as if the disgrace with which he was threatened had already come upon him. The hand upon his shoulder weighed like a hand of lead. It was intolerable. It seemed to crush him. Come, Alan. You must decide at once. I cannot do it, he said mechanically, as though words could alter things. You must. You have no choice. Don't delay. He hesitated a moment. Is there a fire in the room upstairs? Yes, there is a gas fire with asbestos. I shall have to go home and get some things from the laboratory. No, Alan, you must not leave the house. Write out on a sheet of notepaper what you want, and my servant will take a cab and bring the things back to you. Campbell scrawled a few lines, blotted them, and addressed an envelope to his assistant. Dorian took the note up and read it carefully. Then he rang the bell and gave it to his valet, with orders to return as soon as possible and to bring the things with him. As the hall door shut, Campbell started nervously, and having got up from the chair, went over to the chimney piece. He was shivering with a kind of ague. For nearly twenty minutes neither of the men spoke. A fly buzzed noisily about the room, and the ticking of the clock was like the beat of a hammer. As the chime struck one, Campbell turned round, and looking at Dorian Gray, saw that his eyes were filled with tears. There was something in the purity and refinement of that sad face that seemed to enrage him. You are infamous, absolutely infamous, he muttered. Hush, Alan. You have saved my life, said Dorian. Your life? Good heavens, what a life that is. You have gone from corruption to corruption, and now you have culminated in crime. In doing what I am going to do, what you force me to do, it is not of your life that I am thinking. Ah, Alan, murmured Dorian with a sigh, I wish you had a thousandth part of the pity for me that I have for you. He turned away as he spoke and stood looking out of the garden. Campbell made no answer. After about ten minutes a knock came to the door, and the servant entered carrying a large mahogany chest of chemicals with a long coil of steel and platinum wire and two rather curiously shaped iron clamps. Shall I leave the things here, sir? He asked Campbell. Yes, said Dorian, and I am afraid, Francis, that I have another errand for you. What is the name of the man at Richmond who supplies Selby with orchids? Harden, sir. Yes, Harden. He must go down to Richmond at once, see Harden personally, and tell him to send twice as many orchids as I ordered and to have as few white ones as possible. In fact, I don't want any white ones. It is a lovely day, Francis, and Richmond is a very pretty place. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother you about it. No trouble, sir. At what time shall I be back? 
Dorian looked at Campbell. How long will your experiment take, Alan? He said in a calm, indifferent voice. The presence of a third person in the room seemed to give him extraordinary courage. Campbell frowned and bit his lip. It will take about five hours, he answered. It will be time enough then if you are back at half past seven, Francis. Or stay, just leave my things out for dressing. You can have the evening to yourself. I am not dining at home, so I shall not want you. Thank you, sir, said the man, leaving the room. Now, Alan, there is not a moment to be lost. How heavy this chest is. I'll take it for you. You bring the other things. He spoke rapidly and in an authoritative manner. Campbell felt dominated by him. They left the room together. When they reached the top landing, Dorian took out the key and turned it in the lock. Then he stopped, and a troubled look came into his eyes. He shuddered. I don't think I can go in, Alan, he murmured. It is nothing to me, I don't require you, said Campbell coldly. Dorian half opened the door. As he did so, he saw the face of his portrait leering in the sunlight. On the floor in front of it, the torn curtain was lying. He remembered that the night before he had forgotten, for the first time in his life, to hide the fatal canvas, and was about to rush forward when he drew back with a shudder. What was that loathsome red dew that gleamed, wet and glistening on one of the hands, as though the canvas had sweated blood? How horrible it was! More horrible it seemed to him for the moment than the silent thing that he knew was stretched across the table the thing whose grotesque, misshapen shadow on the spotted carpet showed him that it had not stirred, but was still there, as he had left it. He heaved a deep breath, opened the door a little wider, and with half-closed eyes and averted head walked quickly in, determined that he would not look even once upon the dead man. Then, stooping down and taking up the gold and purple hanging, he flung it right over the picture. There he stopped, feeling afraid to turn round, and his eyes fixed themselves on the intricacies of the pattern before him. He heard Campbell bringing in the heavy chest and the irons and the other things that he had required for his dreadful work. He began to wonder if he and Basil Hallward had ever met, and if so, what they had thought of each other. Leave me now, said a stern voice behind him. He turned and hurried out, just conscious that the dead man had been thrust back into the chair and that Campbell was gazing into a glistening yellow face. As he was going downstairs, he heard the key being turned in the lock. It was long after seven when Campbell came back into the library. He was pale, but absolutely calm. I have done what you asked me to do, he muttered. And now, goodbye. Let us never see each other again. You have saved me from ruin, Alan. I cannot forget that said Dorian simply. As soon as Campbell had left, he went upstairs. There was a horrible smell of nitric acid in the room, but the thing that had been sitting at the table was gone. Chapter 15 That evening at 8.30, exquisitely dressed and wearing a large buttonhole of Palmer violets, Dorian Gray was ushered into Lady Narborough's drawing room by bowing servants. His forehead was throbbing with maddened nerves, and he felt wildly excited, but his manner as he bent over his hostess's hand was as easy and graceful as ever. Perhaps one never seems so much at one's ease as when one has to play a part. Certainly no one looking at Dorian Gray that night could have believed that he had passed through a tragedy as horrible as any tragedy of our age. Those finely shaped fingers could never have clutched a knife for sin, nor those smiling lips have cried out on God and goodness. He himself could not help wondering at the calm of his demeanour, and for a moment felt keenly the terrible pleasure of a double life. It was a small party got up rather in a hurry by Lady Narborough, who was a very clever woman, with what Lord Henry used to describe as the remains of really remarkable ugliness. She had proved an excellent wife to one of our most tedious ambassadors, and having buried her husband properly in a marble mausoleum which she had herself designed, and married off her daughters to some rich, rather elderly men, she devoted herself now to the pleasures of French fiction, French cookery, and French esprit when she could get it. Dorian was one of her especial favourites, 
and she always told him that she was extremely glad she had not met him in early life. I know, my dear, I should have fallen madly in love with you, she used to say, and thrown my bonnet right over the mills for your sake. It is most fortunate that you were not thought of at the time. As it was, our bonnets were so unbecoming, and the mills were so occupied in trying to raise the wind that I never had even a flirtation with anybody. However, that was all Narborough's fault. He was dreadfully short-sighted, and there is no pleasure in taking in a husband who never sees anything. Her guests this evening were rather tedious. The fact was, as she explained to Dorian behind a very shabby fan, one of her married daughters had come up quite suddenly to stay with her, and, to make matters worse, had actually brought her husband with her. I think it is most unkind of her, my dear, she whispered. Of course I go and stay with them every summer after I come from Homburg, but then an old woman like me must have fresh air sometimes, and besides, I really wake them up. You don't know what an existence they lead down there. It is pure, unadulterated country life. They get up early because they have so much to do, and go to bed early because they have so little to think about. There has not been a scandal in the neighbourhood since the time of Queen Elizabeth, and consequently they all fall asleep after dinner. You shan't sit next to either of them. You shall sit by me and amuse me. Dorian murmured a graceful compliment and looked round the room. Yes, it was certainly a tedious party. Two of the people he had never seen before, and the others consisted of Ernest Harridan, one of those middle-aged mediocrities so common in London clubs who have no enemies but are thoroughly disliked by their friends, Lady Roxton, an overdressed woman of forty-seven with a hooked nose, who was always trying to get herself compromised, but was so peculiarly plain that to her great disappointment no one would ever believe anything against her. Mrs. Erlin, a pushing nobody with a delightful lisp, and Venetian red hair, Lady Alice Chapman, his hostess's daughter, a dowdy, dull girl with one of those characteristic British faces that, once seen, are never remembered, and her husband, a red-cheeked, white-whiskered creature who, like so many of his class, was under the impression that inordinate joviality can atone for an entire lack of ideas. He was rather sorry he had come, till Lady Narborough, looking at the great ormolu gilt clock that sprawled in gaudy curves on the mauve-draped mantel-shelf, exclaimed, "'How horrid of Henry Wootton to be so late! I sent round to him this morning on chance, and he promised faithfully not to disappoint me.' It was some consolation that Harry was to be there, and when the door opened and he heard his slow musical voice lending charm to some insincere apology, he ceased to feel bored. But at dinner he could not eat anything, Plate after plate went away untasted. Lady Narborough kept scolding him for what she called an insult to poor Adolphe, who invented the menu specially for you. And now and then Lord Henry looked cross at him, wondering at his silence and abstracted manner. From time to time the butler filled his glass with champagne. He drank eagerly, and his thirst seemed to increase. Dorian, said Lord Henry at last, as the chauffeur was being handed round. What is the matter with you tonight? You are quite out of sorts. I believe he is in love, cried Lady Narborough, and that he is afraid to tell me for fear I should be jealous. He is quite right. I certainly should. Dear Lady Narborough, murmured Dorian, smiling, I have not been in love for a whole week, not in fact since Madame de Ferrel left town. How you men can fall in love with that woman, exclaimed the old lady. I really cannot understand it. It is simply because she remembers you when you were a little girl, Lady Narborough, said Lord Henry. She is the one link between us and your short frocks. She does not remember my short frocks at all, Lord Henry, but I remember her very well at Vienna thirty years ago and how décolleté she was then. She is still décolleté, he answered, taking an olive in his long fingers. And when she is in a very smart gown, she looks like an édition de luxe of a bad French novel. She is really wonderful and full of surprises. Her capacity for family affection is extraordinary. When her third husband died, her hair turned quite gold from grief. How can you, Harry? cried Dorian. It is a most romantic explanation, laughed the hostess. But her third husband, Lord Henry, you don't mean to say Ferrell is the fourth? Certainly, Lady Narborough. I don't believe a word of it. Well, ask Mr. Gray. He is one of her most intimate friends. Is it true, Mr. Gray? She assures me so, Lady Narborough, said Dorian. I asked her whether, like Marguerite de Navarre, she had their hearts embalmed and hung at her girdle. She told me she didn't, because none of them had any hearts at all. 
Four husbands. Upon my word, that is trop de zèle. Trop d'audace, I tell her, said Dorian. Oh, she is audacious enough for anything, my dear. And what is Ferrell like? I don't know him. The husbands of very beautiful women belong to the criminal classes, said Lord Henry, sipping his wine. Lady Narborough hit him with her fan. Lord Henry, I am not at all surprised that the world says you are extremely wicked. But what world says that? asked Lord Henry, elevating his eyebrows. It can only be the next world. This world and I are on excellent terms. Everybody I know says you are very wicked, cried the old lady, shaking her head. Lord Henry looked serious for some moments. It is perfectly monstrous, he said at last, the way people go about nowadays seeing things against one behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. Isn't he incorrigible, cried Dorian, leaning forward in his chair. I hope so, said his hostess, laughing. But really, if you all worship Madame de Ferrell in this ridiculous way, I shall have to marry again so as to be in the fashion. You will never marry again, Lady Narborough, broke in Lord Henry. You were far too happy. When a woman marries again, it is because she detested her first husband. When a man marries again, it is because he adored his first wife. Women try their luck. Men risk theirs. Narborough wasn't perfect, cried the old lady. If he had been, you would not have loved him, my dear lady, was the rejoinder. Women love us for our defects. If we have enough of them, they will forgive us everything, even our intellects. You will never ask me to dinner again after saying this, I am afraid, Lady Narborough, but it is quite true. Of course it is true, Lord Henry. If we women did not love you for your defects, where would you all be? Not one of you would ever be married. You would be a set of unfortunate bachelors. Not, however, that that would alter you much. Nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors, and all the bachelors like married men. Fan de siècle murmured Lord Henry. Fan de globe, answered his hostess. I wish it were fan de globe, said Dorian with a sigh. Life is a great disappointment. Ah, my dear, cried Lady Narborough, putting on her gloves, don't tell me that you have exhausted life. When a man says that, one knows that life has exhausted him. Lord Henry is very wicked, and I sometimes wish that I had been, but you are made to be good. You look so good. I must find you a nice wife. Lord Henry, don't you think that Mr. Grey should get married? I am always telling him so, Lady Narborough, said Lord Henry with a bow. Well, we must look out for a suitable match for him. I shall go through Debrett carefully tonight and draw out a list of all the eligible young ladies. With their ages, Lady Narborough? asked Dorian. Of course, with their ages, slightly edited. But nothing must be done in a hurry. I want it to be what the Morning Post calls a suitable alliance, and I want you both to be happy. What nonsense people talk about happy marriages, exclaimed Lord Henry. A man can be happy with any woman, as long as he does not love her. Ah, what a cynic you are, cried the old lady, pushing back her chair and nodding to Lady Ruxton. You must come and dine with me soon again. You are really an admirable tonic, much better than what Sir Andrew prescribes for me. You must tell me what people you would like to meet, though. I want it to be a delightful gathering. I like men who have a future and women who have a past, he answered. Or do you think that would make it a petticoat party? I fear so, she said, laughing as she stood up. A thousand pardons, my dear Lady Ruxton, she added. I didn't see you hadn't finished your cigarette. Never mind, Lady Narborough. I smoke a great deal too much. I'm going to limit myself for the future. Pray don't, Lady Ruxton, said Lord Henry. Moderation is a fatal thing. Enough is as bad as a meal. More than enough is as good as a feast. Lady Ruxton glanced at him curiously. You must come and explain that to me some afternoon, Lord Henry. It sounds a fascinating theory, she murmured as she swept out of the room. Now, mind you don't stay too long over your politics and scandal, cried Lady Narborough from the door. If you do, we are sure to squabble upstairs. The men laughed, and Mr. Chapman got up solemnly from the foot of the table and came up to the top. Dorian Gray changed his seat and went and sat by Lord Henry. Mr. Chapman began to talk in a loud voice about the situation in the House of Commons. He guffawed at his adversaries. The word doctrinaire, word full of terror to the British mind, reappeared from time to time between his explosions. An alliterative prefix served as an ornament of oratory. He hoisted the Union Jack on the pinnacles of thought, the inherited stupidity of the race, sound English common sense, he jovially termed it, was shown to be the proper bulwark for society. 
A smile curved Lord Henry's lips, and he turned round and looked at Dorian. Are you better, my dear fellow? he asked. You seemed rather out of sorts at dinner. I am quite well, Harry. I am tired, that is all. You were charming last night. The little Duchess is quite devoted to you. She tells me she is going down to Selby. She has promised to come on the 20th. Is Monmouth to be there too? Oh, yes, Harry. He bores me dreadfully, almost as much as he bores her. She is very clever, too clever for a woman. She lacks the indefinable charm of weakness. It is the feet of clay that makes the gold of the image precious. Her feet are very pretty, but they are not feet of clay. White porcelain feet, if you like. They have been through the fire, and what fire does not destroy, it hardens. She has had experiences. How long has she been married? asked Dorian. An eternity, she tells me, I believe, according to the peerage, it is ten years, but ten years with Monmouth must have been like eternity, with time thrown in. Who else is coming? Oh, the Willoughbys, Lord Rugby and his wife, our hostess, Geoffrey Clouston, the usual set. I have asked Lord Grotrian. I like him, said Lord Henry. A great many people don't, but I find him charming. He atones for being occasionally somewhat overdressed by being always absolutely overeducated. He is a very modern type. I don't know if he will be able to come, Harry. He may have to go to Monte Carlo with his father. Ah, what a nuisance people's people are. Try and make him come. By the way, Dorian, you ran off very early last night. You left before eleven. What did you do afterwards? Did you go straight home? Dorian glanced at him hurriedly and frowned. No, Harry, he said at last. I did not get home till nearly three. Did you go to the club? Yes, he answered. Then he bit his lip. No, I don't mean that. I didn't go to the club. I walked about. I forget what I did. How inquisitive you are, Harry. You always want to know what one has been doing. I always want to forget what I have been doing. I came in at half past two, if you wish to know the exact time. I had left my latchkey at home and my servant had to let me in. If you want any corroborative evidence on the subject, you can ask him. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. My dear fellow, as if I cared. Let us go up to the drawing room. No sherry, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Something has happened to you, Dorian. Tell me what it is. You are not yourself tonight. Don't mind me, Harry. I am irritable and out of temper. I shall come round and see you tomorrow, or next day. Make my excuses to Lady Narborough. I shan't go upstairs. I shall go home. I must go home. All right, Dorian. I dare say I shall see you tomorrow at tea time. The Duchess is coming. I will try to be there, Harry, he said, leaving the room. As he drove back to his own house, he was conscious that the sense of terror he thought he had strangled had come back to him. Lord Henry's casual questioning had made him lose his nerves for the moment, and he wanted his nerve still. Things that were dangerous had to be destroyed. He winced. He hated the idea of even touching them. Yet it had to be done. He realised that, and when he had locked the door of his library, he opened the secret press into which he had thrust Basil Hallward's coat and bag. A huge fire was blazing. He piled another log on it. The smell of the singeing clothes and burning leather was horrible. It took him three quarters of an hour to consume everything. At the end he felt faint and sick, and having lit some Algerian pastilles in a pierced copper brazier, he bathed his hands and forehead with a cool, musk-scented vinegar. Suddenly he started. His eyes grew strangely bright and he gnawed nervously at his underlip. Between two of the windows stood a large Florentine cabinet made out of ebony and inlaid with ivory and blue lapis. He watched it as though it were a thing that could fascinate and make afraid, as though it held something that he longed for and yet almost loathed. His breath quickened. A mad craving came over him. He lit a cigarette and then threw it away. His eyelids drooped till the long, fringed lashes almost touched his cheek. But he still watched the cabinet. At last he got up from the sofa on which he had been lying, went over to it, and having unlocked it, touched some hidden spring. A triangular drawer passed slowly out. His fingers moved instinctively towards it, dipped in and closed on something. It was a small Chinese box of black and gold dust lacquer, elaborately wrought, the sides patterned with curved waves, and the silken cords hung with round crystals and tasseled in plaited metal threads. He opened it. Inside was a green paste, waxy in lustre, 
the odour curiously heavy and persistent. He hesitated for some moments with a strangely immobile smile upon his face. Then, shivering, though the atmosphere of the room was terribly hot, he drew himself up and glanced at the clock. It was twenty minutes to twelve. He put the box back, shutting the cabinet doors as he did so, and went into his bedroom. As midnight was striking bronze blows upon the dusky air, Dorian Gray, dressed commonly and with a muffler wrapped round his throat, crept quietly out of his house. In Bond Street he found a hansom with a good horse. He hailed it and in a low voice gave the driver an address. The man shook his head. It is too far for me, he muttered. Here's a sovereign for you, said Dorian. You shall have another if you drive fast. All right, sir, answered the man. You'll be there in an hour. And after his fare had got in, he turned his horse round and drove rapidly towards the river. Chapter 16 A cold rain began to fall, and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing, and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. From some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter. In others, drunkards brawled and screamed. Lying back in the hansom, with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city, and now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry had said to him on the first day they had met, to cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. Yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it, and would try it again now. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion, dens of horror, where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time a huge, misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer, and the streets more narrow and gloomy. Once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile. A steam rose from the horse as it splashed up the puddles. The side windows of the hansom were clogged with a grey flannel mist. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. How the words rang in his ears. His soul, certainly, was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it? Innocent blood had been spilt. What could atone for that? Ah, for that there was no atonement. But though forgiveness was impossible, Forgetfulness was possible still, and he was determined to forget, to stamp the thing out, to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one. Indeed, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as he had done? Who had made him a judge over others? He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plodded the hansom, going slower, it seemed to him, at each step. He thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer and the man was silent. The way seemed interminable and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider. The monotony became unbearable, and as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by lonely brickfields. The fog was lighter here, and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire. A dog barked as they went by, and far away in the darkness some wandering seagull screamed. The horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. After some time they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark, but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamp-lit blind. He watched them curiously. They moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things. He hated them. A dull rage was in his heart. 
As they turned a corner, a woman yelled something at them from an open door, and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly with hideous iteration, the bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense, till he had found in them the full expression, as it were, of his mood, and justified by intellectual approval, passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought, and the wild desire to live most terrible of all man's appetites, quickened into force each trembling nerve and fibre. Ugliness that had once been hateful to him, because it made things real, became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was the one reality. The coarse brawl, the loathsome den, the crude violence of disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art the dreamy shadows of song. They were what he needed for forgetfulness. In three days he would be free. Suddenly the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards. Somewhere about here, sir, ain't it? He asked huskily through the trap. Dorian started and peered round. This will do, he answered, and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, he walked quickly in the direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered in the puddles. A red glare came from an outward-bound steamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like a wet Macintosh. He hurried on towards the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes, he reached a small, shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave a peculiar knock. After a little time, he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked. The door opened quietly and he went in without saying a word to the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed. At the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a long, low room which looked as if it had once been a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged round the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, making quivering discs of light. The floor was covered with ochre-coloured sawdust, trampled here and there into mud and stained with dark rings of spilt liquor. Some Malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove, playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table and by the tawdrily painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. He thinks he's got red ants on him, laughed one of them as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. At the end of the room there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber. As Dorian hurried up its three rickety steps, the heavy odour of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath, and his nostrils quivered with pleasure. When he entered, a young man with smooth yellow hair, who was bending over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe, looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. You hear, Adrian? muttered Dorian. Where else should I be? he answered listlessly. None of the chaps will speak to me now. I thought you had left England. Darlington is not going to do anything. My brother paid the bill at last. George doesn't speak to me either. I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I have had too many friends. Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. The twisted limbs the gaping mouths, 
The staring, lusterless eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought. Memory, like a horrible malady, was eating his soul away. From time to time he seemed to see the eyes of Basil Hallward looking at him. Yet he felt he could not stay. The presence of Adrian Singleton troubled him. He wanted to be where no one would know who he was. He wanted to escape from himself. I'm going on to the other place, he said after a pause. On the wharf? Yes, that mad cat is sure to be there. They won't have her in this place now. Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I am sick of women who love one. Women who hate one are much more interesting. Besides, the stuff is better. Much the same. I like it better. Come and have something to drink. I must have something. I don't want anything, murmured the young man. Never mind. Adrian Singleton rose up wearily and followed Dorian to the bar. A half-caste in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them. The women sidled up and began to chatter. Dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to Adrian Singleton. A crooked smile, like a Malay crease, writhed across the face of one of the women. We are very proud tonight, she sneered. For God's sake, don't talk to me, cried Dorian, stamping his foot on the ground. What do you want, money? Here it is. Don't ever talk to me again. Two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes, then flickered out, and left them dull and glazed. She tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers. Her companion watched her enviously. It's no use, sighed Adrian Singleton. I don't care to go back. What does it matter? I am quite happy here. You will write to me if you want anything, won't you? said Dorian after a pause. Perhaps. Good night, then. Good night, answered the young man, passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief. Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face. As he drew the curtain aside, a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money. There goes the devil's bargain, she hiccoughed in a hoarse voice. Curse you, he answered. Don't call me that. She snapped her fingers. Prince Charming's what you like to be called, ain't it? She yelled after him. The drowsy sailor leapt to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly round. The sound of the shutting of the hall door fell on his ear. He rushed out as if in pursuit. Dorian Gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain. His meeting with Adrian Singleton had strangely moved him, and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door, as Basil Hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult. He bit his lip, and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad. Yet, after all, what did it matter to him? One's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders. Each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it. The only pity was one had to pay so often for a single fault. One had to pay over and over again, indeed. In her dealings with man, destiny never closed her accounts. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passion for sin, or for what the world calls sin, so dominates a nature that every fibre of the body, as every cell of the brain, seems to be instinct with fearful impulses. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible end as automatons move. Choice is taken from them, and conscience is either killed, or if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm. For all sins, as theologians weary not of reminding us, are sins of disobedience. When that high spirit, that morning star of evil, fell from heaven, it was as a rebel that he fell. Callous, concentrated on evil, with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion, Dorian Gray hastened on, quickening his step as he went. But as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going, 
he felt himself suddenly seized from behind, and before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand round his throat. He struggled madly for life, and by a terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second, he heard the click of a revolver and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointing straight at his head and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. What do you want? he gasped. Keep quiet, said the man. If you stir, I shoot you. You are mad. What have I done to you? You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane, was the answer. And Sybil Vane was my sister. She killed herself, I know it. Her death is at your door. I swore I would kill you in return. For years I have sought you. I had no clue, no trace. The two people who could have described you were dead. I knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die. Dorian Gray grew sick with fear. I never knew her, he stammered. I never heard of her. You are mad. You had better confess your sin, for as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die. There was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. Down on your knees, growled the man. I give you one minute to make your peace, no more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job first. One minute, that's all. Dorian's arms fell to his side. Paralysed with terror, he did not know what to do. Suddenly, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop! he cried. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. Why do you ask me? What do years matter? Eighteen years? laughed Dorian Gray, with a touch of triumph in his voice. Eighteen years? Set me under the lamp and look at my face. James Vane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light, yet it served to show him the hideous error, as it seemed, into which he had fallen. For the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unstained purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, Hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life. He loosened his hold and reeled back. My God, my God, he cried, and I would have murdered you. Dorian Gray drew a long breath. You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man, he said, looking at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Forgive me, sir, muttered James Vane. I was deceived. A chance word I heard in that damn den set me on the wrong track. You had better go home and put that pistol away or you may get into trouble, said Dorian, turning on his heel and going slowly down the street. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror, he was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked round with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. Why didn't you kill him? She hissed out, putting her haggard face quite close to his. I knew you were following him when you rushed out from Daly's. You fool, you should have killed him. He has lots of money, and he's as bad as bad. He is not the man I am looking for, he answered, and I want no man's money. I want a man's life. The man whose life I want must be nearly forty now. This one is little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood upon my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. Little more than a boy, she sneered. Why, man, it's nigh on eighteen years since Prince Charming made me what I am. You lie, cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I am telling the truth, she cried. Before God? Strike me dumb if it ain't so, 
He is the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on 18 years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. You swear this? I swear it, came in hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I am afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodging. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street. But Dorian Gray had disappeared. When he looked back, the woman had vanished also. Chapter 17 A week later, Dorian Gray was sitting in the conservatory at Selby Royal, talking to the pretty Duchess of Monmouth, who with her husband, a jaded-looking man of sixty, was amongst his guests. It was tea time, and the mellow light of the huge lace-covered lamp that stood on the table lit up the delicate china and hammered silver of the service at which the Duchess was presiding. Her white hands were moving daintily among the cups, and her full red lips were smiling at something that Dorian had whispered to her. Lord Henry was lying back in a silk-draped wicker chair looking at them. On a peach-coloured divan sat Lady Narborough, pretending to listen to the Duke's description of the last Brazilian beetle that he had added to his collection. Three young men in elaborate smoking suits were handing tea cakes to some of the women. The house party consisted of twelve people, and there were more expected to arrive on the next day. "'What are you two talking about?' said Lord Henry, strolling over to the table and putting his cup down. "'I hope Dorian has told you about my plan for rechristening everything, Gladys. It is a delightful idea.' "'But I don't want to be rechristened, Harry,' rejoined the Duchess, looking up at him with her wonderful eyes. I am quite satisfied with my own name, and I am sure Mr. Gray should be satisfied with his. My dear Gladys, I would not alter either name for the world. They are both perfect. I was thinking chiefly of flowers. Yesterday I cut an orchid for my buttonhole. It was a marvellous spotted thing, as effective as the seven deadly sins. In a thoughtless moment I asked one of the gardeners what it was called. He told me it was a fine specimen of Robinsoniana or something dreadful of that kind. It is a sad truth, but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things. Names are everything. I never quarrel with actions. My one quarrel is with words. That is the reason I hate vulgar realism in literature. The man who could call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing he is fit for. Then what should we call you, Harry? she asked. His name is Prince Paradox, said Dorian. I recognise him in a flash, exclaimed the Duchess. I won't hear of it, laughed Lord Henry, sinking into a chair. From a label there is no escape. I refuse the title. Royalties may not abdicate, fell as a warning from pretty lips. You wish me to defend my throne, then? Yes. I give the truths of tomorrow. I prefer the mistakes of today she answered. You disarm me, Gladys, he cried, catching the willfulness of her mood. Of your shield, Harry, not of your spear. I never tilt against beauty, he said, with a wave of his hand. That is your error, Harry, believe me. You value beauty far too much. How can you say that? I admit that I think that it is better to be beautiful than to be good. But on the other hand, no one is more ready than I am to acknowledge that it is better to be good than to be ugly. Ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins, then, cried the Duchess. What becomes of your simile about the orchid? Ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues, Gladys. You, as a good Tory, must not underrate them. Beer, the Bible, and the seven deadly virtues have made our England what she is. You don't like your country, then? she asked. I live in it. That you may censure it the better. Would you have me take the verdict of Europe on it? he inquired. What do they say of us? That Tartuffe has emigrated to England and opened a shop. Is that yours, Harry? I give it to you. I could not use it. It is too true. You need not be afraid. 
Our countrymen never recognize a description. They are practical. They are more cunning than practical. When they make up their ledger, they balance stupidity by wealth and vice by hypocrisy. Still, we have done great things. Great things have been thrust on us, Gladys. We have carried their burden, only as far as the stock exchange. She shook her head. I believe in the race, she cried. It represents the survival of the pushing. It has development. Decay fascinates me more. What of art? she asked. It is a malady. Love? An illusion. Religion? The fashionable substitute for belief. You are a sceptic. Never. Scepticism is the beginning of faith. What are you? To define is to limit. Give me a clue. Threads snap. You would lose your way in the labyrinth. You bewilder me. Let us talk of someone else. Our host is a delightful topic. Years ago, he was christened Prince Charming. Ah, don't remind me of that, cried Dorian Gray. Our host is rather horrid this evening, answered the Duchess, colouring. I believe he thinks that Monmouth married me on purely scientific principles, as the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly. Well, I hope he won't stick pins into you, Duchess, laughed Dorian. Oh, my maid does that already, Mr Gray, when she is annoyed with me. And what does she get annoyed with you about, Duchess? For the most trivial things, Mr Gray, I assure you. Usually because I come in at ten minutes to nine and tell her that I must be dressed by half past eight. How unreasonable of her. You should give her warning. I daren't, Mr Gray. Why, she invents hats for me. You remember the one I wore at Lady Hilston's garden party? You don't, but it is nice of you to pretend that you do. Well, she made it out of nothing. All good hats are made out of nothing. Like all good reputations, Gladys, interrupted Lord Henry. Every effect that one produces gives one an enemy. To be popular, one must be a mediocrity. Not with women, said the Duchess, shaking her head. And women rule the world. I assure you we can't bear mediocrities. We women, as someone says, love with our ears, just as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. It seems to me that we never do anything else, murmured Dorian. Ah, then you never really love, Mr. Gray, answered the Duchess with mock sadness. My dear Gladys, cried Lord Henry, how can you say that? Romance lives by repetition, and repetition converts an appetite into an art. Besides, each time that one loves is the only time one has ever loved. Difference of object does not alter singleness of passion. It merely intensifies it. We can have in life but one great experience at best, and the secret of life is to reproduce that experience as often as possible. Even when one has been wounded by it, Harry, asked the Duchess after a pause. Especially when one has been wounded by it, answered Lord Henry. The Duchess turned and looked at Dorian Gray with a curious expression in her eyes. What do you say to that, Mr Gray? she inquired. Dorian hesitated for a moment. Then he threw his head back and laughed. I always agree with Harry, Duchess. Even when he is wrong? Harry is never wrong, Duchess. And does his philosophy make you happy? I have never searched for happiness. Who wants happiness? I have searched for pleasure. And found it, Mr. Gray? Often. Too often. The Duchess sighed. I am searching for peace, she said, and if I don't go and dress, I shall have none this evening. Let me get you some orchids, Duchess, cried Dorian, starting to his feet and walking down the conservatory. You are flirting disgracefully with him, said Lord Henry to his cousin. You had better take care. He is very fascinating. If he were not, there would be no battle. Greek meets Greek, then. I am on the side of the Trojans. They fought for a woman. They were defeated. There are worse things than capture, she answered. You gallop with a loose rein. Pace gives life, was the riposte. I shall write it in my diary tonight. What? That a burnt child loves the fire. I am not even singed, 
My wings are untouched. You use them for everything except flight. Courage has passed from men to women. It is a new experience for us. You have a rival. Who? He laughed. Lady Narbra, he whispered. She perfectly adores him. You fill me with apprehension. The appeal to antiquity is fatal to us who are romanticists. Romanticists. You have all the methods of science. Men have educated us, but not explained you. Describe us as a sex, was her challenge. Sphinxes without secrets. She looked at him, smiling. How long Mr. Gray is, she said. Let us go and help him. I have not yet told him the colour of my frock. Ah, you must suit your frock to his flowers, Gladys. That would be a premature surrender. Romantic art begins with its climax. I must keep an opportunity for retreat. In the Parthian manner. They found safety in the desert. I could not do that. Women are not always allowed a choice, he answered. But hardly had he finished the sentence before from the far end of the conservatory came a stifled groan, followed by the dull sound of a heavy fall. Everybody started up. The Duchess stood motionless in horror, and with fear in his eyes, Lord Henry rushed through the flapping palms to find Dorian Gray lying face downwards on the tiled floor in a death-like swoon. He was carried at once into the blue drawing-room and laid upon one of the sofas. After a short time he came to himself and looked round with a dazed expression. What has happened? he asked. Oh, I remember. Am I safe here, Harry? He began to tremble. My dear Dorian, answered Lord Henry, you merely fainted, that was all. You must have overtired yourself. You had better not come down to dinner. I will take your place. No, I will come down, he said, struggling to his feet. I would rather come down. I must not be alone. He went to his room and dressed. There was a wild recklessness of gaiety in his manner as he sat at table. But now and then, a thrill of terror ran through him when he remembered that pressed against the window of the conservatory, like a white handkerchief, he had seen the face of James Vane watching him. Chapter 18 The next day he did not leave the house, and indeed spent most of the time in his own room, sick with a wild terror of dying and yet indifferent to life itself. The consciousness of being hunted, snared, tracked down had begun to dominate him. If the tapestry did but tremble in the wind, he shook. The dead leaves that were blown against the leaded panes seemed to him like his own wasted resolutions and wild regrets. When he closed his eyes, he saw again the sailor's face peering through the mist-stained glass, and horror seemed once more to lay its hand upon his heart. But perhaps it had been only his fancy that had called vengeance out of the night and set the hideous shapes of punishment before him. Actual life was chaos, but there was something terribly logical in the imagination. It was the imagination that set remorse to dog the feet of sin. It was the imagination that made each crime bear its misshapen brood. In the common world of fact, the wicked were not punished, nor the good rewarded. Success was given to the strong, failure thrust upon the weak, that was all. Besides, had any stranger been prowling round the house, he would have been seen by the servants or the keepers. Had any footmarks been found on the flower beds, the gardeners would have reported it. Yes, it had been merely fancy. Sybil Vane's brother had not come back to kill him. He had sailed away in his ship to founder in some winter sea. From him, at any rate, he was safe. Why, the man did not know who he was, could not know who he was. The mask of youth had saved him. And yet, if it had been merely an illusion, how terrible it was to think that conscience could raise such fearful phantoms and give them visible form and make them move before one. What sort of life would his be if day and night shadows of his crime were to peer at him from silent corners, to mock him from secret places, 
to whisper in his ear as he sat at the feast, to wake him with icy fingers as he lay asleep. As the thought crept through his brain, he grew pale with terror, and the air seemed to him to have become suddenly colder. Oh, in what a wild hour of madness he had killed his friend. How ghastly the mere memory of the scene. He saw it all again. Each hideous detail came back to him with added horror. Out of the black cave of time, terrible and swathed in scarlet, rose the image of his sin. When Lord Henry came in at six o'clock, he found him crying as one whose heart will break. It was not till the third day that he ventured to go out. There was something in the clear, pine-scented air of that winter morning that seemed to bring him back his joyousness and his ardour for life. But it was not merely the physical conditions of environment that had caused the change. His own nature had revolted against the excess of anguish that had sought to maim and mar the perfection of its calm. With subtle and finely wrought temperaments it is always so. Their strong passions must either bruise or bend. They either slay the man or themselves die. Shallow sorrows and shallow loves live on. The loves and sorrows that are great are destroyed by their own plenitude. Besides, he had convinced himself that he had been the victim of a terror-stricken imagination and looked back now on his fears with something of pity and not a little of contempt. After breakfast, he walked with the Duchess for an hour in the garden and then drove across the park to join the shooting party. The crisp frost lay like salt upon the grass. The sky was an inverted cup of blue metal. A thin film of ice bordered the flat, reed-grown lake. At the corner of the pine wood, he caught sight of Sir Geoffrey Clouston, the Duchess's brother, jerking two spent cartridges out of his gun. He jumped from the cart, and having told the groom to take the mare home, made his way towards his guest through the withered bracken and rough undergrowth. "'Have you had good sport, Geoffrey? he asked. "'Not very good, Dorian. I think most of the birds have gone to the open. I dare say it will be better after lunch when we get to new ground.' Dorian strolled along by his side, the keen, aromatic air, the brown and red lights that glimmered in the wood, the hoarse cries of the beaters ringing out from time to time, and the sharp snaps of the guns that followed, fascinated him, and filled him with a sense of delightful freedom. He was dominated by the carelessness of happiness, by the high indifference of joy. Suddenly, from a lumpy tussock of old grass some twenty yards in front of them, with black-tipped ears erect and long, hinder limbs throwing it forward, started a hare. It bolted for a thicket of alders. Sir Geoffrey put his gun to his shoulder. But there was something in the animal's grace of movement that strangely charmed Dorian Gray, and he cried out at once, Don't shoot it, Geoffrey! Let it live! What nonsense, Dorian! laughed his companion, and as the hare bounded into the thicket, he fired. There were two cries heard, the cry of a hare in pain, which is dreadful, the cry of a man in agony, which is worse. Good heavens, I have hit a beater, exclaimed Sir Geoffrey. What an ass the man was to get in front of the guns. Stop shooting there, he called out at the top of his voice. A man is hurt. The head keeper came running up with a stick in his hand. Where, sir? Where is he? he shouted. At the same time, the firing ceased along the line. Here, answered Sir Geoffrey, angrily, hurrying towards the thicket. Why on earth don't you keep your men back? Spoiled my shooting for the day. Dorian watched them as they plunged into the alder clump, brushing the lithe, swinging branches aside. In a few moments they emerged, dragging a body after them into the sunlight. He turned away in horror. It seemed to him that misfortune followed wherever he went. He heard Sir Geoffrey ask if the man was really dead, and the affirmative answer of the keeper. The wood seemed to him to have become suddenly alive with faces. There was the trampling of myriad feet and the low buzz of voices. A great copper-breasted pheasant came beating through the boughs overhead. After a few moments that were to him in his perturbed state like endless hours of pain, he felt a hand laid on his shoulder. He started and looked round. Dorian said Lord Henry. 
I had better tell them that the shooting is stopped for today. It would not look well to go on. I wish it were stopped forever, Harry, he answered bitterly. The whole thing is hideous and cruel. Is the man... He could not finish the sentence. I am afraid so, rejoined Lord Henry. He got the whole charge of shot in his chest. He must have died almost instantaneously. Come, let us go home. They walked side by side in the direction of the avenue for nearly fifty yards without speaking. Then Dorian looked at Lord Henry and said with a heavy sigh, It is a bad omen, Harry, a very bad omen. What is? asked Lord Henry. Oh, this accident, I suppose. My dear fellow, it can't be helped. It was the man's own fault. Why did he get in front of the guns? Besides, it is nothing to us. It is rather awkward for Geoffrey, of course. It does not do to pepper beaters. It makes people think that one is a wild shot, and Geoffrey is not. He shoots very straight. But there is no use talking about the matter. Dorian shook his head. It is a bad omen, Harry. I feel as if something horrible were going to happen to some of us. To myself, perhaps, he added, passing his hand over his eyes with a gesture of pain. The elder man laughed. The only horrible thing in the world is ennui, Dorian. That is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness. But we are not likely to suffer from it, unless these fellows keep chattering about this thing at dinner. I must tell them that the subject is to be tabooed. As for omens, there is no such thing as an omen. Destiny does not send us heralds. She is too wise or too cruel for that. Besides... What on earth could happen to you, Dorian? You have everything in the world that a man can want. There is no one who would not be delighted to change places with you. There is no one with whom I would not change places, Harry. Don't laugh like that, I am telling you the truth. The wretched peasant who has just died is better off than I am. I have no terror of death. It is the coming of death that terrifies me. Its monstrous wings seem to wheel in the leaden air around me. Good heavens, don't you see a man moving behind the trees there, watching me, waiting for me? Lord Henry looked in the direction in which the trembling, gloved hand was pointing. Yes, he said, smiling. I see the gardener waiting for you. I suppose he wants to ask you what flowers you wish to have on the table tonight. How absurdly nervous you are, my dear fellow. You must come and see my doctor when we get back to town. Dorian heaved a sigh of relief as he saw the gardener approaching. The man touched his hat, glanced for a moment at Lord Henry in a hesitating manner, and then produced a letter which he handed to his master. Oh, Grace told me to wait for an answer, he murmured. Dorian put the letter into his pocket. Tell her, Grace, that I am coming in, he said coldly. The man turned round and went rapidly in the direction of the house. How fond women are of doing dangerous things, laughed Lord Henry. It is one of the qualities in them that I admire most. A woman will flirt with anybody in the world as long as other people are looking on. How fond you are of saying dangerous things, Harry. In the present instance you are quite astray. I like the Duchess very much, but I don't love her. And the Duchess loves you very much, but she likes you less, so you are excellently matched. You are talking scandal, Harry, and there is never any basis for scandal. The basis of every scandal is an immoral certainty, said Lord Henry, lighting a cigarette. You would sacrifice anybody, Harry, for the sake of an epigram. The world goes to the altar of its own accord, was the answer. I wish I could love, cried Dorian Gray, with a deep note of pathos in his voice. But I seem to have lost the passion and forgotten the desire. I am too much concentrated on myself. My own personality has become a burden to me. I want to escape, to go away, to forget. It was silly of me to come down here at all. I think I shall send a wire to Harvey to have the yacht got ready. On a yacht, one is safe. Safe from what, Dorian? You are in some trouble. Why not tell me what it is? You know I would help you. I can't tell you, Harry he answered, sadly, and I dare say it is only a fancy of mine. 
This unfortunate accident has upset me. I have a horrible presentiment that something of the kind may happen to me. What nonsense. I hope it is. But I can't help feeling it. Ah, here is the Duchess looking like Artemis in a tailor-made gown. You see, we have come back, Duchess. I have heard all about it, Mr. Grey, she answered. Poor Geoffrey is terribly upset, and it seems that you asked him not to shoot the hare. How curious. Yes, it was very curious. I don't know what made me say it. Some whim, I suppose. It looked the loveliest of little live things. But I am sorry they told you about the man. It is a hideous subject. It is an annoying subject, broke in Lord Henry. It has no psychological value at all. Now, if Geoffrey had done the thing on purpose, how interesting he would be. I should like to know someone who had committed a real murder. How horrid of you, Harry, cried the Duchess. Isn't it, Mr. Grey? Harry, Mr. Grey is ill again. He is going to faint. Dorian drew himself up with an effort and smiled. It is nothing, Duchess, he murmured. My nerves are dreadfully out of order. That is all. I am afraid I walked too far this morning. I didn't hear what Harry said. Was it very bad? You must tell me some other time. I think I must go and lie down. You will excuse me, won't you? They had reached the great flight of steps that led from the conservatory onto the terrace. As the glass door closed behind Dorian, Lord Henry turned and looked at the Duchess with his slumberous eyes. Are you very much in love with him? he asked. She did not answer for some time, but stood gazing at the landscape. I wish I knew, she said at last. He shook his head. Knowledge would be fatal. It is the uncertainty that charms one. A mist makes things wonderful. One may lose one's way. Always end at the same point, my dear Gladys. What is that? Disillusion. It was my debut in life, she sighed. It came to you crowned. I am tired of strawberry leaves. They become you. Only in public. You would miss them, said Lord Henry. I will not part with a petal. Monmouth has ears. Old age is dull of hearing. Has he never been jealous? I wish he had been. He glanced about as if in search of something. What are you looking for? She inquired. The button from your foil, he answered. You have dropped it. She laughed. I have still the mask. It makes your eyes lovelier was his reply. She laughed again. Her teeth showed like white seeds in a scarlet fruit. Upstairs in his own room, Dorian Gray was lying on a sofa with terror in every tingling fibre of his body. Life had suddenly become too hideous a burden for him to bear. The dreadful death of the unlucky beater, shot in the thicket like a wild animal, had seemed to him to prefigure death for himself also. He had nearly swooned at what Lord Henry had said in a chance mood of cynical jesting. At five o'clock he rang his bell for his servant and gave him orders to pack his things for the night express to town and to have the brougham at the door by eight-thirty. He was determined not to sleep another night at Selby Royal. It was an ill-omened place. Death walked there in the sunlight. The grass of the forest had been spotted with blood. Then he wrote a note to Lord Henry telling him that he was going up to town to consult his doctor and asking him to entertain his guests in his absence. As he was putting it into the envelope, a knock came to the door, and his valet informed him that the head keeper wished to see him. He frowned and bit his lip. Send him in, he muttered, after some moment's hesitation. As soon as the man entered, Dorian pulled his checkbook out of a drawer and spread it out before him. I suppose you have come about the unfortunate accident of this morning, Thornton, he said, taking up a pen. Yes, sir, answered the gamekeeper. Was the poor fellow married? Had he any people dependent on him? asked Dorian, looking bored. If so, I should not like them to be left in want, and will send them any sum of money you may think necessary. We don't know who he is, sir. That is what I took the liberty of coming to you about. Don't know who he is? said Dorian listlessly. What do you mean? Wasn't he one of your men? No, sir. Never saw him before. Seems like a sailor, sir. 
The pen dropped from Dorian Gray's hand, and he felt as if his heart had suddenly stopped beating. A sailor, he cried out. Did you say a sailor? Yes, sir. He looks as if he had been a sort of sailor, tattooed on both arms and that kind of thing. Was there anything found on him? said Dorian, leaning forward and looking at the man with startled eyes. Anything that would tell his name? Some money, sir, not much, and a six-shooter. There was no name of any kind. A decent-looking man, sir, but rough-like. A sort of sailor, we think. Dorian started to his feet. A terrible hope fluttered past him. He clutched at it madly. Where is the body? he exclaimed. Quick, I must see it at once. It is in an empty stable in the home farm, sir. The folk don't like to have that sort of thing in their houses. They say a corpse brings bad luck. The home farm? Go there at once and meet me. Tell one of the grooms to bring my horse round. No, never mind, I'll go to the stables myself. It will save time. In less than a quarter of an hour, Dorian Gray was galloping down the long avenue as hard as he could go. The trees seemed to sweep past him in spectral procession and wild shadows to fling themselves across his path. Once the mare swerved at a white gatepost and nearly threw him. He lashed her across the neck with his crop. She cleft the dusky air like an arrow. The stones flew from her hooves. At last he reached the home farm. Two men were loitering in the yard. He leapt from the saddle and threw the reins to one of them. In the farthest stable a light was glimmering. Something seemed to tell him that the body was there, and he hurried to the door and put his hand upon the latch. There he paused for a moment, feeling that he was on the brink of a discovery that would either make or mar his life. Then he thrust the door open and entered. On a heap of sacking in the far corner was lying the dead body of a man dressed in a coarse shirt and a pair of blue trousers. A spotted handkerchief had been placed over the face. A coarse candle stuck in a bottle sputtered beside it. Dorian Gray shuddered. He felt that his could not be the hand to take the handkerchief away, and called out to one of the farm servants to come to him. Take that thing off the face. I wish to see it, he said, clutching at the doorpost for support. When the farm servant had done so, he stepped forward. A cry of joy broke from his lips. The man who had been shot in the thicket was James Vane. He stood there for some minutes, looking at the dead body. As he rode home, his eyes were full of tears, for he knew he was safe. Chapter 19 There is no use telling me that you are going to be good, cried Lord Henry, dipping his white fingers into a red copper bowl filled with rose water. You are quite perfect. Pray, don't change. Dorian Gray shook his head. No, Harry, I have done too many dreadful things in my life. I am not going to do any more. I began my good actions yesterday. Where were you yesterday? In the country, Harry. I was staying at a little inn by myself. My dear boy, said Lord Henry, smiling, anybody can be good in the country. There are no temptations there. That is the reason why people who live out of town are so absolutely uncivilized. Civilization is not by any means an easy thing to attain to. There are only two ways by which man can reach it. One is by being cultured, the other by being corrupt. Country people have no opportunity of being either, so they stagnate. Culture and corruption, echoed Dorian. I have known something of both. It seems terrible to me now that they should ever be found together. For I have a new ideal, Harry. I am going to alter. I think I have altered. You have not yet told me what your good action was. Or did you say you had done more than one? Asked his companion, as he spilt into his plate a little crimson pyramid of seeded strawberries and threw a perforated shell-shaped spoon snowed white sugar upon them. I can tell you, Harry. It is not a story I could tell to anyone else. I spared somebody. It sounds vain, but you understand what I mean. She was quite beautiful, and wonderfully like Sybil Vane. I think it was that which first attracted me to her. You remember Sybil, don't you? How long ago that seems. Well, 
Hetty was not one of our own class, of course. She was simply a girl in a village. But I really loved her. I am quite sure that I loved her. All during this wonderful May that we have been having, I used to run down and see her two or three times a week. Yesterday she met me in a little orchard. The apple blossoms kept tumbling down on her hair, and she was laughing. We were to have gone away together this morning at dawn. Suddenly I determined to leave her as flower-like as I had found her. I should think the novelty of the emotion must have given you a thrill of real pleasure, Dorian, interrupted Lord Henry. But I can finish your idyll for you. You gave her good advice and broke her heart. That was the beginning of your reformation. Harry, you are horrible. You mustn't say these dreadful things. Hetty's heart is not broken. Of course she cried and all that, but there is no disgrace upon her. She can live, like Perdita, in her garden of mint and marigold. And weep over a faithless florizel, said Lord Henry, laughing as he leant back in his chair. My dear Dorian, you have the most curiously boyish moods. Do you think this girl will ever be really contented now with anyone of her own rank? I suppose she will be married some day to a rough carter or a grinning ploughman. Well, the fact of having met you and loved you will teach her to despise her husband and she will be wretched. From a moral point of view, I cannot say that I think much of your great renunciation. Even as a beginning, it is poor. Besides, how do you know that Hetty isn't floating at the present moment in some starlit mill pond with lovely water lilies round her like Ophelia? I can't bear this, Harry. You mock at everything and then suggest the most serious tragedies. I am sorry I told you now. I don't care what you say to me. I know I was right in acting as I did. Poor Hetty. As I rode past the farm this morning, I saw her white face at the window like a spray of jasmine. Don't let us talk about it any more. And don't try to persuade me that the first good action I have done for years, the first little bit of self-sacrifice I have ever known, is really a sort of sin. I want to be better. I am going to be better. Tell me something about yourself. What is going on in town? I have not been to the club for days. The people are still discussing poor Basil's disappearance. I should have thought they had got tired of that by this time, said Dorian pouring himself out some wine and frowning slightly. My dear boy, they have only been talking about it for six weeks, and the British public are really not equal to the mental strain of having more than one topic every three months. They have been very fortunate lately, however. They have had my own divorce case and Alan Campbell's suicide. Now they have got the mysterious disappearance of an artist. Scotland Yard still insists that the man in the grey Ulster who left for Paris by the midnight train on the 9th of November was poor Basil, and the French police declare that Basil never arrived in Paris at all. I suppose in about a fortnight we shall be told that he has been seen in San Francisco. It is an odd thing, but everyone who disappears is said to be seen at San Francisco. It must be a delightful city and possess all the attractions of the next world. What do you think has happened to Basil? asked Dorian, holding up his burgundy against the light and wondering how it was that he could discuss the matter so calmly. I have not the slightest idea. If Basil chooses to hide himself, it is no business of mine. If he is dead, I don't want to think about him. Death is the only thing that ever terrifies me. I hate it. Why? said the younger man, wearily. Because, said Lord Henry, passing beneath his nostrils the gilt trellis of an open vinaigrette box, one can survive everything nowadays except that. Death and vulgarity are the only two facts in the 19th century that one cannot explain away. Let us have our coffee in the music room, Dorian. You must play Chopin to me. The man with whom my wife ran away played Chopin exquisitely. Poor Victoria, I was very fond of her. The house is rather lonely without her. Of course, married life is merely a habit, a bad habit. But then one regrets the loss even of one's worst habits. Perhaps one regrets them the most. They are an essential part of one's personality. Dorian said nothing, but rose from the table, and passing into the next room, sat down to the piano and let his fingers stray across the white and black ivory of the keys. After the coffee had been brought in, he stopped, and looking over at Lord Henry, said, Harry, did it ever occur to you that Basil was murdered? Lord Henry yawned. Basil was very popular and always wore a Waterbury watch. Why should he have been murdered? 
He was not clever enough to have enemies. Of course, he had a wonderful genius for painting, but a man can paint like Velasquez and yet be as dull as possible. Basil was really rather dull. He only interested me once, and that was when he told me years ago that he had a wild adoration for you and that you were the dominant motive of his art. I was very fond of Basil, said Dorian, with a note of sadness in his voice. But don't people say that he was murdered? Oh, some of the papers do. It does not seem to me to be at all probable. I know there are dreadful places in Paris, but Basil was not the sort of man to have gone to them. He had no curiosity. It was his chief defect. What would you say, Harry, if I told you that I had murdered Basil? Said the younger man. He watched him intently after he had spoken. I would say, my dear fellow, that you were posing for a character that doesn't suit you. All crime is vulgar, just as all vulgarity is crime. It is not in you, Dorian, to commit a murder. I am sorry if I hurt your vanity by saying so, but I assure you it is true. Crime belongs exclusively to the lower orders. I don't blame them in the smallest degree. I should fancy that crime was to them what art is to us, simply a method of procuring extraordinary sensations. A method of procuring sensations? Do you think, then, that a man who has once committed a murder could possibly do the same crime again? Don't tell me that. Oh, anything becomes a pleasure if one does it too often, cried Lord Henry, laughing. That is one of the most important secrets of life. I should fancy, however, that murder is always a mistake. One should never do anything that one cannot talk about after dinner. But let us pass from poor Basil. I wish I could believe that he had come to such a really romantic end as you suggest, but I can't. I dare say he fell into the Seine off an omnibus and that the conductor hushed up the scandal. Yes, I should fancy that was his end. I see him lying now on his back under those dull green waters with the heavy barges floating over him and long weeds catching in his hair. Do you know I don't think he would have done much more good work? During the last ten years, his painting had gone off very much. Dorian heaved a sigh, and Lord Henry strolled across the room and began to stroke the head of a curious Java parrot, a large grey-plumaged bird with pink crest and tail that was balancing itself upon a bamboo perch. As his pointed fingers touched it, it dropped the white scurf of crinkled lids over black glass-like eyes and began to sway backwards and forwards. Yes, he continued, turning round and taking his handkerchief out of his pocket. His painting had quite gone off. It seemed to me to have lost something. It had lost an ideal. When you and he ceased to be great friends, he ceased to be a great artist. What was it separated you? I suppose he bored you. If so, he never forgave you. It's a habit bores have. By the way, what has become of that wonderful portrait he did of you? I don't think I've ever seen it since he finished it. Oh, I remember your telling me years ago that you had it sent down to Selby and that it had got mislaid or stolen on the way. You never got it back? What a pity. It really was a masterpiece. I remember I wanted to buy it. I wish I had now. It belonged to Basil's best period. Since then, his work was that curious mixture of bad painting and good intentions that always entitles a man to be called a representative British artist. Did you advertise for it? You should. I forget, said Dorian. I suppose I did, but I never really liked it. I am sorry I sat for it. The memory of the thing is hateful to me. Why do you talk of it? It used to remind me of those curious lines in some play. Hamlet, I think. How do they run? Like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart. Yes, that is what it was like. Lord Henry laughed. If a man treats life artistically, his brain is his heart, he answered, sinking into an armchair. Dorian Gray shook his head and struck some soft chords on the piano. Like the painting of a sorrow, he repeated, a face without a heart. The elder man lay back and looked at him with half-closed eyes. By the way, Dorian, he said after a pause, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose, how does the quotation run, his own soul? The music jarred and Dorian Gray started 
and stared at his friend. Why do you ask me that, Harry? My dear fellow, said Lord Henry, elevating his eyebrows in surprise. I asked you because I thought you might be able to give me an answer. That is all. I was going through the park last Sunday, and close by the marble arch there stood a little crowd of shabby-looking people listening to some vulgar street preacher. As I passed by, I heard the man yelling out that question to his audience. It struck me as being rather dramatic. London is very rich in curious effects of that kind. A wet Sunday, an uncouth Christian in a Macintosh, a ring of sickly white faces under a broken roof of dripping umbrellas, and a wonderful phrase flung into the air by shrill, hysterical lips. It was really very good in its way, quite a suggestion. I thought of telling the prophet that art had a soul, but that man had not. I am afraid, however, he would not have understood me. Don't, Harry. The soul is a terrible reality. It can be bought and sold and bartered away. It can be poisoned or made perfect. There is a soul in each one of us, I know it. Do you feel quite sure of that, Dorian? Quite sure. Ah, then it must be an illusion. The things one feels absolutely certain about are never true. That is the fatality of faith and the lesson of romance. How grave you are. Don't be so serious. What have you or I to do with the superstitions of our age? No, we have given up our belief in the soul. Play me something. Play me a nocturne, Dorian. And as you play, tell me in a low voice how you have kept your youth. You must have some secret. I am only ten years older than you are, and I am wrinkled and worn and yellow. You are really wonderful, Dorian. You have never looked more charming than you do tonight. You remind me of the day I saw you first. You are rather cheeky, very shy, and absolutely extraordinary. You have changed, of course, but not in appearance. I wish you would tell me your secret. To get back my youth, I would do anything in the world, except take exercise, get up early, or be respectable. Youth! There is nothing like it. It's absurd to talk of the ignorance of youth. The only people to whose opinions I listen now with any respect are people much younger than myself. They seem in front of me. Life has revealed to them her latest wonder. As for the aged, I always contradict the aged. I do it on principle. If you ask them their opinions on something that happened yesterday, they solemnly give you the opinions current in 1820, when people wore high stocks, believed in everything, and knew absolutely nothing. How lovely that thing you are playing is. I wonder, did Chopin write it at Majorca, with the sea weeping round the villa and the salt spray dashing against the panes? It is marvellously romantic. What a blessing it is that there is one art left to us that is not imitative. Don't stop. I want music tonight. It seems to me that you are the young Apollo and that I am Marcius listening to you. I have sorrows, Dorian, of my own that even you know nothing of. The tragedy of old age is not that one is old, but that one is young. I am amazed sometimes at my own sincerity. Ah, Dorian, how happy you are. What an exquisite life you have had. You have drunk deeply of everything. You have crushed the grapes against your palate. Nothing has been hidden from you, and it has all been to you no more than the sound of music. It has not marred you. You are still the same. I am not the same, Harry. Yes, you are the same. I wonder what the rest of your life will be. Don't spoil it by renunciations. At present you are a perfect type. Don't make yourself incomplete. You are quite flawless now. You need not shake your head, you know you are. Besides, Dorian, don't deceive yourself. Life is not governed by will or intention. Life is a question of nerves and fibres and slowly built up cells in which thought hides itself and passion has its dreams. You may fancy yourself safe and think yourself strong, but a chance tone of colour in a room or a morning sky, a particular perfume that you had once loved and that brings subtle memories with it, a line from a forgotten poem that you had come across again, a cadence from a piece of music that you had ceased to play. I tell you, Dorian, that it is on things like these that our lives depend. 
Browning writes about that somewhere, but our own senses will imagine them for us. There are moments when the odour of Lila Blanc passes suddenly across me, and I have to live the strangest month of my life over again. I wish I could change places with you, Dorian. The world has cried out against us both, but it has always worshipped you. It always will worship you. You are the type of what the age is searching for, and what it is afraid it has found. I am so glad that you have never done anything, never carved a statue or painted a picture, or produced anything outside of yourself. Life has been your art. You have set yourself to music. Your days are your sonnets. Dorian rose up from the piano and passed his hand through his hair. Yes, life has been exquisite, he murmured. But I am not going to have the same life, Harry. And you must not say these extravagant things to me. You don't know everything about me. I think that if you did, even you would turn from me. You laugh. Don't laugh. Why have you stopped playing, Dorian? Go back and give me the nocturne over again. Look at that great honey-coloured moon that hangs in the dusky air. She is waiting for you to charm her, and if you play, she will come closer to the earth. You won't. Let us go to the club, then. It has been a charming evening, and we must end it charmingly. There is someone at White's who wants immensely to know you, young Lord Poole, Bournemouth's eldest son. He has already copied your neckties and has begged me to introduce him to you. He is quite delightful and rather reminds me of you. I hope not, said Dorian, with a sad look in his eyes. But I am tired tonight, Harry. I shan't go to the club. It is nearly eleven and I want to go to bed early. Do stay. You have never played so well as tonight. There was something in your touch that was wonderful. It had more expression than I had ever heard from it before. It is because I am going to be good, he answered, smiling. I am a little changed already. You cannot change to me, Dorian, said Lord Henry. You and I will always be friends. Yet you poisoned me with a book once. I should not forgive that. Harry, promise me that you will never lend that book to anyone. It does harm. My dear boy, you are really beginning to moralise. You will soon be going about like the converted and the revivalist warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired. You are much too delightful to do that. Besides, it is no use. You and I are what we are and will be what we will be. As for being poisoned by a book, there is no such thing as that. Art has no influence upon action. It annihilates the desire to act. It is superbly sterile. The books that the world calls immoral are books that show the world its own shame. That is all. But we won't discuss literature. Come round tomorrow. I am going to ride at eleven. We might go together, and I will take you to lunch afterwards with Lady Branksome. She is a charming woman and wants to consult you about some tapestries she is thinking of buying. Mind you come. Or shall we lunch with our little duchess? She says she never sees you now. Perhaps you are tired of Gladys. I thought you would be. Her clever tongue gets on one's nerves. Well, in any case, be here at eleven. Must I really come, Harry? Certainly. The park is quite lovely now. I don't think there have been such lilacs since the year I met you. Very well. I shall be here at eleven, said Dorian. Good night, Harry. As he reached the door, he hesitated for a moment, as if he had something more to say. Then he sighed and went out. Chapter 20 It was a lovely night, so warm that he threw his coat over his arm and did not even put his silk scarf round his throat. As he strolled home, smoking his cigarette, two young men in evening dress passed him, he heard one of them whisper to the other, That is Dorian Gray. He remembered how pleased he used to be when he was pointed out, or stared at or talked about. He was tired of hearing his own name now. Half the charm of the little village where he had been so often lately was that no one knew who he was. He had often told the girl whom he had lured to love him that he was poor, and she had believed him. He had told her once that he was wicked, and she had laughed at him 
and answered that wicked people were always very old and very ugly. What a laugh she had, just like a thrush singing, and how pretty she had been in her cotton dresses and her large hats. She knew nothing, but she had everything that he had lost. When he reached home, he found his servant waiting up for him. He sent him to bed and threw himself down on the sofa in the library and began to think over some of the things that Lord Henry had said to him. Was it really true that one could never change? He felt a wild longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood, his rose-white boyhood, as Lord Henry had once called it. He knew that he had tarnished himself, filled his mind with corruption and given horror to his fancy, that he had been an evil influence to others and had experienced a terrible joy in being so, and that of the lives that had crossed his own, it had been the fairest and the most full of promise that he had brought to shame. But was it all irretrievable? Was there no hope for him? Ah, in what a monstrous moment of pride and passion he had prayed that the portrait should bear the burden of his days, and he keep the unsullied splendour of eternal youth. All his failure had been due to that. Better for him that each sin of his life had brought its sure, swift penalty along with it. There was purification in punishment. Not forgive us our sins, but smite us for our iniquities, should be the prayer of man to a most just God. The curiously carved mirror that Lord Henry had given to him so many years ago now was standing on the table, and the white-limbed cupids laughed round as of old. He took it up as he had done on that night of horror when he had first noted the change in the fatal picture, and with wild, tear-dimmed eyes looked into its polished shield. Once, someone who had terribly loved him had written to him a mad letter ending with these idolatrous words. The world is changed because you are made of ivory and gold. The curves of your lips rewrite history. The phrases came back to his memory, and he repeated them over and over to himself. Then he loathed his own beauty, and flinging the mirror on the floor, crushed it into silver splinters beneath his heel. It was his beauty that had ruined him, his beauty and the youth that he had prayed for. But for those two things, his life might have been free from stain. His beauty had been to him but a mask, his youth but a mockery. What was youth at best? A green, an unripe time, a time of shallow moods and sickly thoughts. Why had he worn its livery? Youth had spoiled him. It was better not to think of the past. Nothing could alter that. It was of himself and of his own future that he had to think. James Vane was hidden in a nameless grave in Selby Churchyard. Alan Campbell had shot himself one night in his laboratory, but had not revealed the secret that he had been forced to know. The excitement, such as it was, over Basil Horwood's disappearance would soon pass away. It was already waning. He was perfectly safe there. Nor, indeed, was it the death of Basil Horwood that weighed most upon his mind. It was the living death of his own soul that troubled him. Basil had painted the portrait that had marred his life. He could not forgive him that. It was the portrait that had done everything. Basil had said things to him that were unbearable, and that he had yet borne with patience. The murder had been simply the madness of a moment. As for Alan Campbell, his suicide had been his own act. He had chosen to do it. It was nothing to him. A new life. That was what he wanted. That was what he was waiting for. Surely he had begun it already. He had spared one innocent thing, at any rate. He would never again tempt innocence. He would be good. As he thought of Hetty Merton, he began to wonder if the portrait in the locked room had changed. Surely it was not still so horrible as it had been. Perhaps if his life became pure, he would be able to expel every sign of evil passion from the face. Perhaps the signs of evil had already gone away. He would go and look. He took the lamp from the table and crept upstairs. As he unbarred the door, 
A smile of joy flitted across his strangely young-looking face and lingered for a moment about his lips. Yes, he would be good, and the hideous thing that he had hidden away would no longer be a terror to him. He felt as if the load had been lifted from him already. He went in quietly, locking the door behind him, as was his custom, and dragged the purple hanging from the portrait. A cry of pain and indignation broke from him. He could see no change, save that in the eyes there was a look of cunning and in the mouth the curved wrinkle of the hypocrite. The thing was still loathsome, more loathsome if possible than before, and the scarlet dew that spotted the hand seemed brighter and more like blood newly spilt. Then he trembled. Had it been merely vanity that had made him do his one good deed? or the desire for a new sensation, as Lord Henry had hinted with his mocking laugh, or that passion to act a part that sometimes makes us do things finer than we are ourselves, or perhaps all these. And why was the red stain larger than it had been? It seemed to have crept like a horrible disease over the wrinkled fingers. There was blood on the painted feet, as though the thing had dripped, blood even on the hand that had not held the knife. Confess? Did it mean that he was to confess? To give himself up and be put to death? He laughed. He felt that the idea was monstrous. Besides, even if he did confess, who would believe him? There was no trace of the murdered man anywhere. Everything belonging to him had been destroyed. He himself had burned what had been below stairs. The world would simply say that he was mad. They would shut him up if he persisted in his story. Yet it was his duty to confess, to suffer public shame and to make public atonement. There was a God who called upon men to tell their sins to earth as well as to heaven. Nothing that he could do would cleanse him till he had told his own sin. His sin. He shrugged his shoulders. The death of Basil Hallward seemed very little to him. He was thinking of Hetty Merton. For it was an unjust mirror, this mirror of his soul that he was looking at. Vanity, curiosity, hypocrisy. Had there been nothing more in his renunciation than that? There had been something more. At least he thought so, but who could tell? No, there had been nothing more. Through vanity he had spared her. In hypocrisy he had worn the mask of goodness, for curiosity's sake, he had tried the denial of self. He recognised that now. But this murder, was it to dog him all his life? Was he always to be burdened by his past? Was he really to confess? Never. There was only one bit of evidence left against him. The picture itself. That was evidence. He would destroy it. Why had he kept it so long? Once it had given him pleasure to watch it changing and growing old. Of late he had felt no such pleasure. It had kept him awake at night. When he had been away, he had been filled with terror lest other eyes should look upon it. It had brought melancholy across his passions. Its mere memory had marred many moments of joy. It had been like conscience to him. Yes, it had been conscience. He would destroy it. He looked round and saw the knife that had stabbed Basil Hallward. He had cleaned it many times till there was no stain left upon it. It was bright and glistened. As it had killed the painter, so it would kill the painter's work, and all that that meant. It would kill the past, and when that was dead, he would be free. It would kill this monstrous soul life, and without its hideous warnings, he would be at peace. He seized the thing and stabbed the picture with it. There was a cry heard and a crash. The cry was so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke and crept out of their rooms. Two gentlemen who were passing in the square below stopped and looked up at the great house. They walked on till they met a policeman and brought him back. The man rang the bell several times, but there was no answer except for a light in one of the top windows. The house was all dark. After a time, he went away, 
and stood in an adjoining portico and watched. Whose house is that, constable? asked the elder of the two gentlemen. Mr. Dorian Gray's, sir, answered the policeman. They looked at each other as they walked away and sneered. One of them was Sir Henry Ashton's uncle. Inside, in the servants' part of the house, the half-clad domestics were talking in low whispers to each other. Old Mrs. Leaf was crying and wringing her hands. Francis was as pale as death. After about a quarter of an hour, he got the coachman and one of the footmen and crept upstairs. They knocked, but there was no reply. They called out. Everything was still. Finally, after vainly trying to force the door, they got on the roof and dropped down onto the balcony. The windows yielded easily, their bolts were old. When they entered, they found, hanging upon the wall, a splendid portrait of their master as they had last seen him, in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty. Lying on the floor, was a dead man in evening dress, with a knife in his heart. He was withered, wrinkled, and loathsome of visage. It was not till they had examined the rings that they recognized who it was. <laughs>